uh, before we start, I want to just give a little parameters. We have a number of items on today's very busy agenda. It, it'd probably be a, a long day. Um, just so you know, we, are going to, we have two sidewalk cafes that we're going to take up first. Then we have uh, two other items, the stairway text amendment, and then an item in Council Member Traeger's district. And then we'll get to the main event, which is one Vanderbilt, uh, which has the largest crowd here today. Uh, we will take those in that order, more or less. All right, so um, just for attendance purposes, uh, good morning, by the way. Uh, my name is Mark Weprin. I'm chair of the Zoning and Franchises Subcommittee, and I want to welcome everybody here today. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Vincent Gentili, Council Member Dan Gorodnik, Council Member Donovan Richards, and Council Member Antonio Reynoso. We also have been joined by the chair of the Land Use Committee to my left, Council Member David Greenfield. And for sake of the record, um, we just want to give Dan Gorodnik the gold star today. Um, okay, so let's get right into the cafes. First, we're going to start with land use number 195. Otto's Tacos, say that five times fast. And I'd like to call up Philip Robertson, who represents Tacos LLC. Mr. Robertson, welcome. Come to, it's a long table, but why don't you take the one closer to you there. When you get there, make sure the mic is on, state your name for the record, and describe the application. This is on 11 Park Place in Council Member Johnson's district. My Uh, my name is Philip Robertson. Um, I'm representing SW Architects. Uh, we are representing Saiwa Cafe uh, Auto Tacos. Just speak a little louder or a little closer to the mic, one All of right. those two. Dear Council Member Johnson, Auto Tacos Managing Member and of 002 Mercury Tacos LSC is in connection with our application for an unenclosed Saiwa Cafe, hereby commit to the Council I mean, City Council, in light of the concerns of a tree pit. We have finished the tree pit as requested. Please see attached photos. Thank you very much. Any members, uh, Council Member Johnson uh, has been in agreement with this matter, matter and had worked on this letter with them, so he is okay. Do any members of the panel have any questions? Okay, well, with that, well, thank you. We excuse you. Is anyone else here to testify on this cafe? Otto's Tacos? We've got to give you the commercial. Make sure to say it a few times. I see none. We're going to close this hearing and move on to the next item, uh, which is land use number 196. It's Dominique Ansel Kitchen. Uh, is there someone here? Oh, there is someone here. Okay, good. Come on up. It's okay. All right. Uh, same, uh, same rules. Uh, please make sure to state your name. Try to speak loudly into the microphone. Um, describe the application. This, too, is in Council Member Johnson, and I know he's been working with you on this matter as well. Go ahead. Good morning. Better. Okay. Uh, my name is Robert Anik. I'm a consultant working with Dominic Ansel Kitchen for a sidewalk cafe license seating 28 people. The community board has issued three stipulations, uh, which we have uh, addressed in a letter to city council a couple of weeks ago. First one was the removal of a bike rack prior to this hearing. That bike rack was removed on April 13th. The second was a concession made by the operator to close the cafe daily at 7 p.m. The operator has agreed to do that. And the, <clears throat> the third was to submit a revised plan to DCA to include a sign attenuating awning. That plan has been submitted. The plan has also been subsequently approved by the Department of Buildings and the uh, Landmarks Commission. Great, and uh, this too, Councilmember Johnson has helped negotiate, and he is now in favor of this cafe getting its permit. Does anyone on the panel have any questions? I see none again. Thank you very much, sir. You're excused. Does anyone in the audience here to testify on this matter? Seeing none, we're going to close this hearing and now move on. Uh, 
There it is. Okay, next we're going to bring up land use 205, which is the si stairways text amendment. I don't know if I misstated that before, but stairwell. Um, Frank Rushala, Edward Ferrer, uh, Andrea Gold Goldwyn, and Helen Gittelson. There you all are. Look at you, how separated you were. You have to decide where to sit. We have a big panel today. All right. Uh, we have a lot of city employees here, so we want to get you guys back to work, so we put you right up. Um, whenever you're ready, you have a, uh, a PowerPoint, so whenever you're ready to start, just make sure when you speak, you state your name for the record so it's clear who is talking if someone was reading it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Frank Rochella, Deputy Director for Zoning for the Department of City Planning. Uh, the department, um, in collaboration with the Department of Buildings and the Fire Department, is proposing a citywide zoning text amendment to facilitate and make effective additional safety measures that are part of the New York City's 2014 Building Code. These safety measures are intended to enhance public safety in new high-rise non-residential buildings by providing additional existing exiting capacity for building occupants during emergency situations that require full building evacuation. These standard uh, these safety recommendations resulted from an extensive study by the National Institute of Standards and Technology of the World Trade Center disaster. The report recommended several changes to be incorporated into the model building codes, including... Just, uh, just try to speak a little louder, a little sure. clearer. I think uh, my hearing is starting to go, too. So okay. I don't, so I, if you could just try to be as clear and loud as possible. Uh, decreasing the time it takes to evacuate an entire building in an emergency, increasing the ability of first responders to access building occupants, and provide greater redundancy in escape routes to ensure that, uh, so that if one route becomes unavailable, there is still adequate ac uh, capacity to exit or evacuate the building. These changes were adopted into the New York City Building Code as part of Local Law 141 of 2013, aka the, New York, the 2014 Construction Code. The law stipulates, however, that these safety provisions will only become effective once a text amendment is approved to exempt the space occupied by these features from counting towards zoning floor area. The proposed text amendment consists of an amendment to section 1210 of the zoning resolution to exempt floor space that is occupied by the additional safety measures from counting towards zoning floor area. These safety measures are required for all new non-residential buildings that are greater than 420 feet in height or mixed-use buildings that contain non-residential space above a height of 420 feet. Predominantly residential buildings and fully residential buildings are not subject to the additional requirements and are not affected by this text amendment. Um, why not residential? We, we've gotten a couple questions over this. Uh, there are several reasons for this. The first is the building code has more stringent egress requirements for commercial, for non-residential buildings given the higher uh, population generally found in a non-residential building. Additionally, as part of the 2008 building code changes, were made to increase the width of stairs for residential buildings. And the similar text amendment um, exempting uh, floor area for those stairs was included in 2008. Uh, the affected area of the city is generally those areas where high-density buildings are permitted, generally areas like Lower Manhattan, Midtown, Downtown Brooklyn. Um, and in looking at this, the department found in the, about the last 20 years, there were around 29 non-residential buildings that achieved a height of over 420 feet, um, most of them uh, all of them located in these areas. Uh, the building code provision requires that one of the three of the following safety measures be included in the building. Uh, one, occupant evacuant elevators, which are effectively safety elevators that in an emergency one can actually use to exit the building. Two, increased fire stair width. Um, it requires the stair width to be increased by 25%. Um, or the inclusion of a third emergency access stair. Um, the department looked at the size of these in typical buildings and found that are in a per floor, they generally, depending on which one is chosen, uh, range in size from 40 or about 40 square feet to around 150 square feet per floor. Um, and then when we looked at this in relation to actual buildings, this in total in a building would result in at most uh, somewhere around a little less than a single additional story on the top of the building. Um, and we looked at a variety of instances of that. Um, the proposal was referred out to all of the affected community boards as well as the borough presidents um, and all approved the proposal um, as well as the city planning commission. Uh, 
That's it. <laughs> all right, I'm still uh, getting my head around the fact that all those community boards uh, it's approved a, something. It's a rare event. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and approved uh, without conditions, too. It was a, okay, all right. Um, by the way, I didn't mention that I'm joined behind me by uh, Tish James, our public advocate. I, I didn't realize she was there until I heard her giggle at one point, so I, uh, <laughs> I knew she was there. Uh, I'd like to call on Councilmember Gorodnik, who has a question. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, I wanted to know a little bit more about the occupant self-evacuation elevators, because this is a, a concept that I'm not uh, incredibly familiar with. Um, and as I understand it from your presentation, these are elevators that you actually could use in an emergency based on the existence of emergency generators. Is that right? Um, I believe that is correct, yes. Um, and it's an option, it's one of three options, or maybe even one and a half of the three options that are available. So you could either put those in, um, put those in uh, and add 25 percent to your fire exit stairway or just do an additional emergency exit stairway. W what can you tell us about the safety reliability of occupant self-evacuation elevators? It sounds like something that would concern me as somebody who was in a commercial building and was offered an opportunity to get into an elevator to evacuate. You're always told your whole life, do not get into an elevator when it's time to evacuate. But here we're essentially suggesting that that will be one New York City approved method for evacuation. Tell us about the safety and reliability of, of that and why we shouldn't be concerned. Uh, my name is Helen Gittles, and I'm the Executive Director of Code Development at the New York City Department of Buildings. Um, one of the reasons that occupant evacuation elevators are now being um, included in the building code as a way to further full building evacuations is based on the, world, the National Institute of Science and Technology studies which found that a variety of different evacuation methods, for lack of a better word, um, help to evacuate a building quicker. In other words, picture a high-rise building with elderly, uh, handicapped, and without, without several modes of um, getting people out quicker, those people tend to um, decrease the evacuation time walking down the steps. So the studies ha have all found that with the combination of stairs and occupant evacuation elevators, you can evacuate a building much, much quicker. And these types of elevators are hardened, there's emergency communication. So it's not just a regular elevator. It's a special type of elevator. Well, I certainly understand the first part, that m maximizing your options can speed up evacuation. What I'm still a little unclear on is the special type of elevator point as to what it is about this elevator which makes it hardened, secure, uh, impenetrable from problem, uh, and that would give New Yorkers confidence if they needed to get into it, that it's a good thing and will help them get out of the building faster as opposed to be stuck in an elevator. Please state your name. Hi, good morning. My name is Deputy Assistant Chief uh, Edward Ferrier. I'm from the Bureau of Fire Prevention, Fire Department City in New York. Uh, I'd like to address your question. Basically, the occupant evacuation elevator is uh, one of three choices. Uh, you're correct is that um, we've been you know, trained throughout our lifetime not to use elevators in, in case of a fire or emergencies, but as a result of the 9-11 uh, event, uh, NIST did a study, and uh, uh, I believe it's number 17, it's a recommendation by NIST that we need to develop new procedures to, uh, for full building evacuation. Today we're, we're building higher and higher buildings. If you notice that this proposal is for buildings in excess of 420 feet. I believe there's a building now, a residential building that's going up. It's uh, 432 Park. You can't miss it on the skyline. It's quite high. Uh, I've been informed uh, that there's other buildings in the process. Uh, this proposal, it doesn't affect residential. It's for non-residential buildings, non-residential high-rise buildings. And the whole purpose about the occupant evacuation elevator, it's in the terms like a hardened elevator. Basically, it's uh, an elevator that uh, will resist you know, water damage, 
uh, smoke damage. It will uh, prevent the uh, spread of heat, smoke, and gases throughout the building. It's a new design. It, it's something that was uh, put forward by uh, um, ASME as a, a new standard. Uh, it's also in the International Code Council, or International Building Code. They put that in there. So uh, New York City has been adopting the uh, International Code Council's family of codes, and that's in there. So it's, we're moving forward and we're trying to find new ways to uh, evacuate buildings, whether it's uh, for a fire or a natural uh, event or uh, an event, the unlikely event, you know, like a terrorist event, where we can evacuate the building in a timely fashion. And you've got to realize, too, if you have a building that's over 420 feet, you can't expect people to walk down uh, downstairs and get down. Look, I, I appreciate all of that. And I, and I you know, if, if one could be persuaded mm -hmm. that there is a way, other than walking down the stairs, where you could safely evacuate a building, I'm all for it. But it sounds like we are relying on a, a variety of studies that have said, well, in tall, non-residential buildings where you have a high density of population and higher floors, you need alternative measures. And this is one which building, uh, where builders should actually consider as an option. Has any other city implemented occupant evaluation elevators? Could you give us a sense of what that looks like, where, and how they're working? Uh, I don't think any other city has. Uh, I, I think it, it's an, oh, I'm, I'm being corrected here, hold on. Just to, this is uh, Gus Sarakis from the New York City Department of Buildings. Um, the occupant evacuation elevator requirements we've adopted from the International Building Code, which is adopted uh, in many jurisdictions across the country. I don't have which specific jurisdictions, but uh, from the 2012 edition uh, on, it's been in the, uh, in the International Building Code. It's in the code, and I'm sorry to harp on this, but I just, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure that I understand, and I'm sorry that, uh, that I don't, but are there any cities that actually have adopted the rules, and are there buildings out there in the world, I'm not even going to limit us to the United States, were there buildings out there, tall buildings in the world, that have occupant evacuation elevators, and if you can take me to the next step, how have they performed in an emergency? There are definitely jurisdictions that have adopted the International Building Code with the occupant evacuation elevator requirements. Um, I don't have the list of specific buildings that we know of that have occupant evacuation elevators worldwide, but we can get that to you. Okay, so we don't know then how any of them have performed in an emergency either. Is that fair? I, I can't speak to that. I can't speak to that firsthand, though. Um, Mr. Chair, I, uh, you know, I'm a little, little concerned about that answer, but, uh, you know, I will, that's all the questions that I have, but I will flag that as a concern Could I add something? Could I, could I just add something also? Is that the... Uh, okay, you, want, you want to try again, Deputy Chief? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, the ASME standard has been worked on by elevator experts for the last 10 years. Uh, this is not something that's a light undertaking that we're just taking advantage of. It's something that has a lot of forethought uh, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of work to propose this. Uh, hopefully it's, and I say hopefully because again, I, I'm not sure either, but uh, the reality is is that we have to take a step forward to evacuate tall buildings, excessively tall buildings in, in timely fashion. And you know, the, the choice of giving three options is, is something that the fire department is, is in favor of. Just a curiosity, following up a little bit on that point, um, is there any danger that other buildings, and I know everybody has their own fire evacuation plan, but that other buildings will all of a sudden feel confident if they hear about this, of they'll all of a sudden decide to take elevators where they should not in the older buildings? Could you repeat the question? Well, I'm just curious. I mean, if we start, I mean, this is pretty dramatic change of what everyone has always known about leaving a big building, don't take the elevators, you're now saying it will now be okay to take it on these buildings. Does it run the risk as it gets out that people get confused whether they can take an elevator or not in a particular building they are in? I can understand that, yes, that could happen, but uh, with, uh, with training, you know, uh, they're required to have drills with, with training and uh, uh, repeated efforts. 
I think that people will realize that they're working in a building that you know, they can use the elevator for uh, evacuation. Now, you, now, bear in mind, it's not as if, you know, you could, the elevator is going to have indication. There's going to be LED signs. There's, there's, there's a fire command station down in the lobby. There's going to be people who, yeah, announcements are going to be made. I mean, it, it's not taken lightly. And we understand that most people are realizing, you know, act, you know it, it's going to be a slow process. And it's only going to take place in new buildings. Uh, you know, after June 30th, that, that, that permits to file after June 30th. So this is going to be a slow process in the future. And again, it's only going to be in super tall buildings in, in greater than 420 feet. Okay. Anybody else want to comment or question? Um, can I just add one thing? We just was we were just looking, um, and the World Trade Center number three, no, I'm sorry, number four has occup has voluntarily put in occupant evacuation elevators. So they're in, and we can give you some other um, other information that we have back in the office. But, um, so it's currently now a choice that building designers are using, recognizing that they want to, to increase the evacuation capacity uh, to evacuate a, a full building evacuation quicker. If it's possible for to you to get um, some information for Councilman Garodnik and all of us about we'll, other jurisdictions, sure, um, we'll do that. And um, you know that's obviously a concern. Dan, did you add, add something? No. Okay. All right, Council Member Greenfield has one question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have uh, one question. Um, something I was wondering about. It actually came uh, via one of my followers on Twitter. Uh, what took so long to implement this 9-11, uh, post-9-11 proposal? Um, so the you guys are all too soft-spoken for me, oh, you know, nice oh, and strong. Apologies. Uh, We're so very aggressive up here. The, uh, part of it is, is the standards for the elevators had to be developed to, to go through a committee process where experts and stakeholders had the ability to weigh in and, and uh, vet their concerns and make sure that these types of safety enhancements would be implemented properly. Then it's got to go through an adoption process through the International Building Code. There is a, uh, a multi-step process where the elevator and other safety measures like elevators are heard through a committee of building officials, architects, engineers, and other uh, experts, including fire officials, as to uh, getting this adopted. So this made it into the International Building Code in 2012, and we're now adopting this requirement. Still seems like a long time. Excuse me, 2009. Still seems like a, a, a long time, uh, especially considering that it was in the code in 2009. Are there any other safety suggestions that have yet to have been adopted, or is this sort of the last of the safety suggestions? These, this is the last, one of the last groups. Remember, the 2008 code is based on the 2003 international code. So there's, there's lag time for New York City to adopt the international standards. It's a long process for us in the buildings department, and then it comes to the council. So there's always some amount of lag time between when the standards and the new codes <coughs> come out and when we adopt them in New York City by local law. You said uh, one of the last, so the, the, the lawyer in me is curious as to that qualification. What, what else is out there potentially in terms of safety codes that have not yet been adopted some 14 years later? I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I know that um, the last, in 2008, we adopted a number of, um, of recommendations that were in the draft proposal and then this in the draft uh, NIST study, because in 2007, when the local law came out to adopt the 2008 code, the NIST report had not yet been finalized. So we had we reached forward and grabbed some of those in the 2008 code process, and this code process um, enacted many of the others. I can give you a list of, of the proposals and which ones we have adopted when. I just don't have that. Off if you wouldn't mind sending me sure. uh, a letter as sure. to which proposals have been adopted and which have not yet been adopted and what's the timeline on having those final safety proposals adopted, I'd certainly appreciate that. Sure. Thank you very much. Any other questions from Twitter? No, it's, uh, 
It's at NYC Greenfield, Mr. Chairman, in case you're wondering. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Greenfield. Um, any other questions from the panel? All right, seeing none, we're going to excuse this panel and move on to our next item, I believe. And no one else is here to testify on the stairwells amendment? So, okay, then I'm going to close this hearing. Um, and we're going to get that information to Councilmember Gorodnik and to the committee. And um, I'm going to move on to the next item. The next item is land use number 202, 2702 West 15th Street in Brooklyn, <clears throat> in Councilmember Traeger's district. Uh, testifying here today is Joshua Reinsmith and uh, Walter Marin, I believe I got that right. Gentlemen, welcome. Please, I know you guys look like loud speakers, right? You know, talk loudly, clearly. Um, so make sure to state your name when you speak, and please describe this application, which the panel should know. Councilmember Traeger was here earlier and said now has his full support. Gentlemen. Oh, sorry. Good morning. My name is uh, Josh Reinsmith from the firm of Warshaw Burstein, and I'm land use counsel for the applicant. I'm joined here this morning by Walter Marin, who is the project architect. Uh, this is an application that was filed to allow the construction of a new commercial building um, within the special Coney Island mixed-use district. The property is also located within an M12 zoning district. Um, the special Coney Island mixed-use district is a precursor to our current uh, MX zoning districts. Uh, and it was enacted back in, in 1975. Uh, the reason we need a special permit is that any new development at the, the, the site, um, which is a, a zoning lot that exceeds 9,800 square feet, requires a special permit from the City Planning Commission. This would be both for commercial, manufacturing, and or residential uses, all of which are permitted at the location. Um, the applicant is uh, an affiliate of St. Petersburg Global Trade House, which is a retailer of um, Russian literature, books, um, music, as well as souvenirs. And they have retail locations in Brighton Beach, as well as Gravesend and um, in Manhattan. Um, in addition to the, uh, the special permit to allow the construction of any building, we're also requesting a waiver of an open area requirement along a small portion of um, the side lot line. Uh, and the reason that we need this waiver is it allows the, the most efficient configuration of the building. Uh, the building will be three stories, have 24,000 square feet of floor area, and uh, a height of 45 feet, all of which um, complies with the M1-2 zoning district regulations. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. As I mentioned, Councilmember Traeger was here earlier this morning but could not stay, but did express his support of this project. Um, anyone on the panel have a question for these two gentlemen? Uh, you're getting off easy. All right. Thank you. We appreciate it. You are excused. Thank Is you, anyone else here to testify on 2702 West 15th Street? Nobody has answered. So we are going to close this hearing. And before we move on to the main event of the day. Okay. I'm sorry. So before we do that, we're, we're going to take care of some votes. We did have a hearing recently on land use numbers 189, 190, and 191, uh, which is in Councilmember Johnson's district, 505 West 43rd Street. Um, it is a zoning text amendment and two special permits to allow for residential development. Sorry. For residential development over a rail cut of the Amtrak Railway, Railway in Manhattan's Clinton Special District. Okay, we have modifications here I want to read into the record. The development will be achieving a floor area bonus through the provision of affordable housing under the zoning resolution inclusionary housing program. The subcommittee held a public hearing, as I mentioned, on May 20, March 24, 2015. These applications are now front, um, in front of the subcommittee with a vote with the two modifications recommended below. Subsequent to city planning's approval of these actions, it was determined by Amtrak that the emergency vent approved by CPC as a permitted rear yard obstruction needed to be a larger size 
As approved, the vent was approximately 22 feet wide and 17 feet long. It is, has been determined by Amtrak that for safety reasons that the vent must be enlarged by approximately 37 feet and 17 feet long. Um, I would note that the enlarged vent would be screened in the same manner as the smaller one. It is therefore recommended that we vote to modify the plan to increase the size of this emergency vent as described. The second modification proposes the elimination of parking spaces in the building. 21 parking spaces on the ground floor were approved by CPC. These accessory parking spaces are permitted but not required under the zoning resolution. And after discussions with Councilmember Johnson and the applicant, he, they have agreed to eliminate the parking spaces, which will allow for approximately three additional affordable units to be generated by the project. It is therefore recommended that we vote to modify the plans to eliminate the ground floor parking to allow this increased residential floor area. And those are the modifications we are asking to include. So I am now going to, uh, we are going to lay aside the, the stairwells text amendment we just heard uh, now, and uh, we're going to take that off the agenda temporarily, and I'm going to uh, couple the following items in order to vote on this before we get to the uh, one Vanderbilt. Uh, land use number 189, 90, and 91, which I just mentioned, West 43rd Street. Applications with the modifications I just described. Land use numbers 195, Otto's Tacos, the unenclosed sidewalk cafe. Land use number 196, Dominique Ansel's Kitchen, unenclosed sidewalk cafe. And land use number 202, the special permit for 2702 West 15th Street in Councilmember Traeger's district that we just heard. These items are all coupled, and I'm going to call on council to please call the roll for a vote on these items. Chair Weprin. I vote aye. Councilmember Gentile. I vote aye. <coughs> Councilmember Richards. I vote aye. Councilmember Reynoso. I vote aye. My apologies, Councilmember Gorodnik. <laughs> aye. By a vote of five in the affirmative, zero abstentions and no negatives, land use items 195, 196, and 202 are approved, and land use items 189, 190, and 191 are approved by, uh, are approved and referred to the full land use committee with the modif as modified. Super. All right. Okay, we are now going to take up the Vanderbilt Carter and one Vanderbilt. Uh, just trying to get all the items straight here. Uh, these are obviously in Councilmember Gorodnik's district. The Vanderbilt Carter land use numbers 197, 198, um, and then one Vanderbilt Avenue, which is 199, 200, and 201. Uh, we are bringing a big crowd up for this one, I believe. Frank is back. Ruchala, and he's going to talk louder this time. Anita Lermont, okay. Edith Hugh, Hugh Chen, um, all from City Planning. Mark Holliday from SL Green. Rob Schiffer from F SL Green. Jamie Van Klempler from SL Green. And Stephen Lefkowitz from SL Green. How are you all? All right, everyone comfortable? Uh, before we start the presentation, Councilmember Gorodnik has asked to make an opening statement, and I'm going to grant him that. So, Councilmember Gorodnik, please, I know you've been generous, working long and hard. And, and I will not be uh, very long, but I wanted to thank you very much for uh, allowing me to say a few words about the corridor and also about the special permit application for one Vanderbilt. Uh, as you may recall, toward the end of his administration, former Mayor Bloomberg proposed an extensive rezoning of East Midtown. I opposed that plan ultimately while I shared his concerns about the quality and age of office buildings in the area. The mayor's proposal left too many unresolved questions of air rights pricing, public realm improvements, and infrastructure deliverables. This was particularly troubling in the context of so much as of right zoning. Last year, and with my support, Mayor de Blasio and City Planning Commission Chair Weisbrod announced a different two-pronged approach to addressing the zoning challenges in East Midtown. 
The first phase, which is before us today, is a rezoning of Vanderbilt Avenue between 42nd and 47th Streets, in which applicants can apply for a special permit uh, to buy air rights to build up to FAR, 30 FAR. The second phase, also underway, has begun with a steering committee, also chaired by Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and myself to study the needs of Greater East Midtown and to recommend to the mayor how best to address those larger questions. This approach will give us adequate time to consider the bigger and more complicated issues. I am already confident that the public is getting a far better deal. I want to commend the chair of the multi-board task force, Lola Finkelstein, and other members of both community boards five and six, as well as our borough president, Gail Brewer, for their thoughts and recommendations throughout this process. It is no secret that the Grand Central Area and Vanderbilt Avenue in particular are in need of significant improvements. Grand Central is one of the busiest transit hubs in the world and badly needs upgrades to its infrastructure and pedestrian circulation system. Sidewalks in the area are far too narrow and crowded, and Vanderbilt Avenue, a street directly adjacent to one of the most iconic buildings in all of New York City, looks and feels like a back alley. It is my hope that this rezoning will bring some badly needed change to the area. My concerns from the last term, which included the fact that so much certainty was afforded to the development community without any real guarantees to the public, do not exist here. That's because the city and the public maintain full discretion to approve or deny each application through a special permit. If a developer takes this route, the key question here will be whether any given site will deserve the density that it seeks based on the improvements that it intends to make. Of course, not all development sites along the Vanderbilt Carter will necessarily go after or be deserving of the maximum 30 FAR. Well, I believe that this is the appropriate location for the city to encourage high density development, not every site is going to be worthy of the max. As envisioned by the proposal, any applicant along the corridor would have the burden of convincing the public that the proposed infrastructure improvements are worthy of the additional development rights. We, in turn, will demand that any improvements to area infrastructure are done and delivered to the public in advance of the occupancy to the building. The rules allow for us, on a project-by-project -project basis, to hold any developer accountable, and we do, when we do, we can ensure truly sustainable designs and extraordinary architecture that fits within the character of Grand Central. And in conclusion, that brings me to the first private application before us. SL Green is applying for a special permit to build a 30 FAR building at one Vanderbilt. It's on Vanderbilt Avenue between 42nd and 43rd Streets. As part of this proposal, SL Green is transferring development rights from the Bowery Savings Bank, which it also owns. In addition to transferring those rights, the applicant has proposed significant public space and transit improvements, both on and off-site, estimated to cost over $200 million. It's an impressive package of improvements which were identified by the MTA as its top needs. It will be our role here to determine whether the projects outlined are significant enough to warrant such a large density bonus, and if not, what additional improvements should be delivered to the public. So, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to say a few words at the outset here. Um, we look forward to hearing from uh, both applicants, City Planning and also SL Green, and uh, we appreciate your patience this morning. Well said. Thank you, Councilman Garadnik. All right, City Planning, I guess you're leading up, right? Right, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Weprin, Council Member Gorodnik, all council members of this, at this hearing. Um, good morning. My name is Ida Su Chen. I am the director of the Manhattan office at the Department of City Planning. I am joined here by my colleagues Frank Rushala, Deputy Director of Zoning, and our General Counsel, Anita Laramont. I will make a presentation on the city's proposal, uh, the centerpiece of which is a text amendment to uh, create the Vanderbilt Corridor and of course we will be available for questions afterwards. Am I speaking loudly enough for you? Yes, okay, good. <laughs> okay, so um, first and foremost, the purpose of the Vanderbilt Corridor proposal is to ensure the long-term strength of the core area of East Midtown, the city's preeminent commercial district. The centerpiece, as I mentioned earlier, hold on one second, let's get to the next slide, of our proposal is a zoning text amendment. We are creating two new special permits, and we are enhancing an existing special permit. 
The new special permits pertain to, one, the creation of a new uh, floor area bonus uh, called the Grand Central Public Realm Improvement Bonus that will allow for developments within the corridor to achieve floor area uh, bonus in exchange for major improvements to the public realm, including the transit network. Uh, we're also creating a new special permit that deals with hotel use. And the existing special permit we are enhancing is the Grand Central Subdistrict Landmark Transfer. I'll talk about all these in a little bit more detail later. Um, there is also a city map amendment uh, that the city is proposing to one block of Vanderbilt Avenue between 42nd and 43rd. And this would be the precursor for the permanent, uh, reno for the permanent improvement of that space into a pedestrianized zone. Uh, before we get into the proposal, I think it's very important to provide some background um, on, on East Midtown and why this zoning proposal is so critical. Uh, Vanderbilt Corridor, the five blocks uh, bounded by 42nd Street to the south, 47th to the north, Madison Avenue on the west, and Vanderbilt Avenue on the east. It is the heart of East Midtown. It sits immediately adjacent to uh, the Grand Central um, uh, Terminal. Uh, East Midtown is, uh, our, as I mentioned earlier, the powerhouse of all our commercial districts. It has over 70 million square feet of office space, about a quarter million jobs. It is a huge tax base for the city, providing, uh, providing tax base to provide municipal services to all five boroughs. And it is, of course, a regional transit hub. The strength of the area as a commercial district is, of course, based on its role as a transit hub. Uh, the area has incredible transit access as it's anchored by Grand Central Terminal and the subway station. On a daily basis, it sees over 600,000 tri 600, trips and transfers. So this is second only to Penn Station in terms of volume of bringing commuters, workers, visitors uh, into the city. Recognizing the importance of this area in the city, uh, the public sector has continued to invest billions of dollars into the infrastructure. Uh, we have major infrastructure projects, uh, namely the Second Avenue subway, and of course, the East Side Access Project, which will provide a one-seat ride for Long Island Railroad commuters coming into the area. Now, throughout most of the past century, East Midtown has flourished as a commercial district. But within the past two decades, in the most recent, few, recent past, uh, there has been a virtual halt in commercial development in the area. And that is a reason for great concern. This poses serious long-term challenge uh, to the area in terms of its long-term competitiveness as a world-class uh, business district. Every highly competitive business district has a full spectrum of office space, which includes most certainly the very best in office construction, design, sustainability. Um, in East Midtown, uh, we've seen only, we've seen very little construction in the past 20 years. Only 5% of the 70 million square feet of office space was constructed within the last 20 years. There's only been one major new development uh, in the past, uh, since the 1990s. Um, the average age of buildings, as I'm sure you've all heard this statistic, is about 75 years old in the area. Uh, the buildings have, many of the buildings have outdated structural features, very low floor to ceiling heights, and numerous interior columns. This is not the kind of office space that many of today's prospective tenants are looking for. The area also has some serious pedestrian and transit network challenges. There are narrow sidewalks, and most notably, there is a, a congestion, serious congestion at the Grand Central Lex Line. So just to take a moment on that, um, excuse me. Uh, I'll take a moment on that a few, minute, a few moments later. Um, the main issue here, and one that we can deal with, is the zoning. The current regulations in East Midtown are simply obsolete. Uh, in short, the basic maximum FAR in East Midtown is 15 FAR on the avenues, or 12 FAR in the mid-block. This is not enough to incentivize new development, as many of the buildings in the area are already at 15 FAR or greater. So as you can understand, the as of right maximum FAR serves as a barrier, as a disincentive for redevelopment. Um, more recently, 
1992, again, the, excuse me, the base maximum FARs were established in 1982. More recently, in 1992, the city tried to induce development by creating the Grand Central Subdistrict, which uh, had two major goals. Number one, to induce high-density development around the transit hub, and number two, uh, it would do that by uh, encouraging the transfer of development rights from area landmarks, so primarily from Grand Central Terminal, which has a great deal of unused development rights. But in the last 20 years, um, of the 2 million square feet of floor area in, available in the, uh, from landmarks in the subdistrict, only about a quarter of it has been transferred, and there is remaining approximately 1.5 million square feet of unused landmark development rights in the area. The city strongly supports facilitating landmarks to transfer their unused development rights. We think it's a very important uh, thing to address in our proposal. Um, as uh, Council Member Garondick mentioned earlier, um, of course there was a previous proposal for East Midtown under the uh, last mayoral administration, and I won't dwell on this slide as Council Member ha uh, Garondick has already um, outlined the concerns that were raised at the um, previous uh, proposal that ultimately uh, led to the city's withdrawal of that proposal. But here we are. Um, in. Uh, Soon after the withdrawal of the 2013 East Midtown proposal, then Mayor-elect de Blasio committed his incoming administration to take a fresh look at East Midtown. And the direct result of that fresh look are two planning processes following on two separate tracks, one on accelerated track, this one, Vanderbilt Corridor, and the second, the Greater East Midtown planning process. Again, Councilmember Grodnick did touch upon that, so I won't dwell on this slide, uh, but there, we expect to hear from the steering committee, which is led by uh, Councilmember Grodnick and uh, Borough President Brewer, and uh, 10 members, 10 representatives of key stakeholders in the area. We expect to hear recommendations for a planning framework uh, later this spring, uh, perhaps in early summer, and uh, the city will use their recommendations as a basis for a future study and a future EULER. We look forward to hearing the recommendations. Okay. Uh, why it's so important to move on Vanderbilt Corridor. Um, there are th primarily three key and interrelated reasons. First and foremost, there are known near-term development sites. You will, of course, hear from SL Green today. Uh, they are proposing development on the southernmost block, also known as One Vanderbilt. One Vanderbilt. Uh, the MTA also has a, a site that is out on uh, at an RFP right now. The MTA has an RFP to solicit responses for future uh, for their future sale and redevelopment of that site. It's at the middle block, the third block, bounded by 44th and 45th Street on the west side of of that block. Um, those are two very prominent and visible uh, known near-term development sites uh, in the area. Uh, there are. There's a limited ability for landmarks to transfer unused development rights, which I mentioned earlier. This is another very important uh, issue for us to address here. And there are immediate transit and public realm challenges that we think should be improved right away. The most prominent, and here we are, are uh, the challenges in the Grand Central subway station. I think we all know that experience of coming off the subway in the morning, getting on that crowded platform, trying to make your way up the stairs, up to the mezzanine, up to the street. It is very congested. The MTA would love to run more trains through the station on a daily basis. However, they cannot because they cannot move riders uh, quickly and safely enough. This is the bottleneck to the Lex line. If, there if improvements can be made to this subway station, we will see improvements to the entire Lex line and to commuters all around the city and, in fact, the region. So getting to our proposal, um, it was in developing our proposal, number one, we, we addressed the concerns that were raised in the 2013 proposal head on, and we came up with a proposal that, um, number one, is primarily a discretionary review proposal, and most importantly, it provides the certainty that the public and all stakeholders are looking for when it is reviewing, uh, when it is reviewing uh, potential infrastructure improvements. Um, the centerpiece for our text amendment is the new special permit called the Grand Central Public Realm Improvement Bonus. What this special permit does, it allows an increase of floor area from 15 FAR to 30 FAR. 
and this is through the provision of major infrastructure and public realm improvements. Those improvements can be on-site or off-site, at grade or below grade. Very key point, in order for the bonus floor area to be occupied in the building, in order for the TCO to be secured, the completion of the improvements are required. So this gives the certainty with respect to timing and ensures to the public that the infrastructure improvements will be delivered online in advance or at the same time as the density. Uh, the proposal must meet site planning, building massing, and sustainable design requirements. This is the first time in zoning we will we have sustainability requirements. Uh, and this special permit is based on a long-standing bonus mechanism. Uh, you may be familiar with the subway improvement bonus mechanism, which has delivered more than uh, 10 major subway station improvements throughout the city, including at Union Square, at Columbus Circle, and at Court Square in Queens. Uh, we've, we've had uh, this special permit mechanism in the books since the 1980s, and we view our new public realm improvement bonus for the v Vanderbilt Corridor to be the next generation of this important bonus mechanism. Second, uh, in support of our efforts to enhance the ability for landmark owners to transfer their de unused development rights, we are proposing two major modifications to existing special permit for landmark transfer. Number one, we are raising the maximum FAR available to receiving sites in the Vanderbilt Corridor from 21.6 to 30 FAR. Second, we are eliminating the requirement for an infrastructure improvement as part of that landmark transfer transaction. So these are two major improvements to the existing special permit. Um, a note on density, um, 30 FAR, uh, we've heard some comments about 30 FAR being a relatively high number. I think it's very important to stress that the size of the building is a function not just of the FAR, but also of the zoning lot. And here in the Vanderbilt Corridor, we have relatively small zoning lots, even at a full block size. Uh, when you compare them to other major commercial sites in the city, such as in Lower Manhattan or in Hudson Yards. So the maximum density at 30 FAR along the Vanderbilt Corridor will get you at the most 1.3 million zoning square feet, which when you compare to other developments, other recent commercial developments in the city, is actually slightly less. Just a, by way of example, one Bryant Park, uh, the Bank of America headquarters, that is approximately 2.2 uh, million square feet although it's actually calculated around 23 FAR. Um, the, uh, any proposed building at 30 FAR in Vanderbilt Corridor would be smaller than that building, than any building at the World Trade Center or in Hudson Yards. Um, third, we are proposing a new uh, special permit pertaining to hotel use. Uh, during uh, the 2013 East Midtown proposal, we heard a lot of concern about whether or not hotel use should be allowed as of right. Um, here we are proposing that any new construction for hotel or any conversion to hotel use must go through a special permit. And this is to ensure that the new hotel use will be uh, in line, will be suitable with the character of the area as a business district. So this special permit would ensure that hotels provide full array of, a full array of services and amenities to cater to business uh, visitors and uh, users to the district. And finally, um, we have a t city map change that will propose uh, the demapping of uh, one block of Vanderbilt from a vehicular right-of-way into a something called a public place, which will allow for the future transformation of this space into um, a, a beautiful gateway space befitting its immediate adjacency to Grand Central Terminal. The space would be uh, would remain in the city, in the ownership of the city, and under the control and jurisdiction of the Department of Transportation. So that concludes uh, my presentation. Uh, and again, if you have questions, I'm I'm very happy to uh, answer them with my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Now, does S. L. Green going to go now? Right? Okay. I think we're all set. Okay, Mr. Holler. Just make sure when you speak to always say your name if you are switching off. Thank you. Will do. Um, good morning. I'm Mark Holliday, CEO of SL Green. 
Thank you, Chair Weprin and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to present our development proposal for a new commercial tower at 1 Vanderbilt. As the largest owner of commercial properties in Manhattan with over 26 million square feet owned and managed, we care a great deal about the city's zoning initiatives and the important ways they can influence and improve neighborhoods and commercial districts. SL Green's presence is even more pronounced in East Midtown where we own approximately 15% of the district's commercial space across 23 separate properties. We have demonstrated a sincere commitment to East Midtown by greatly improving all of our buildings through the investment of billions and billions of dollars in the acquiring, upgrading, restoring, and retenanting of notable Midtown properties. These improvements, along with the investments made by other building owners, help to make East Midtown one of the most coveted submarkets for businesses wanting high quality and convenient office space. We're extremely proud of the substantial contributions we've made to this community and the impact it has had on the city's economy. However, change is occurring that, if unresponded to, will risk eroding Midtown's, East Midtown's locational desirability and intrinsic building values. More and more businesses are choosing to locate to markets that are much less transit-oriented in order to secure space in newly constructed buildings. Frequently, I talk with tenants who want to be in East Midtown but can't find the state-of-the-art office space that they need. Many are Fortune 500 companies in the industries most critical to New York's economy. They want to be close to Grand Central and in the heart of our most important commercial district. However, many owners and developers, like SL Green, have concluded that new development on sites in East Midtown occupied by older tenanted buildings is extremely challenging to build at today's cost under current zoning. The pr process of developing a spec office building without a major residential component is extremely demanding, costly, and risky. In order to keep this business just district competitive and highly relevant to large corporate users, we need more than just reposition older buildings. We need new, efficient, and environmentally sustainable state-of-the-art office buildings like the one we have proposed for one Vanderbilt. The Vanderbilt corridor rezoning is an important first step in revitalizing East Midtown and halting the corporate exodus from our city's largest business district. By allowing 30 FAR through a special permit, the city is incentivizing owners to invest in the kinds of buildings modern tenants are demanding and investments in much needed transit and public space improvements. This rezoning represents sustainable transit oriented development at its best. It puts density where density belongs around one of New York's busiest transit hubs. As a result, it helps reduce the carbon footprint of newly, construction, uh, newly constructed buildings to levels much lower that can be achieved by building in more remote areas of Manhattan. The rezoning will also help to modernize transit infrastructure to support the creation of a 21st century central business district. At Grand Central, the subway platform, stairwells, escalators, and corridors are immensely overcrowded and increasingly difficult to navigate. The situation will only get worse when east side access opens, stressing the system beyond its capacity. That's why this approach makes so much sense, enabling the development of badly needed new buildings and also providing investment in the transit system that makes this density possible. With $210 million worth of public capital designated for transit and open space infrastructure upgrades, the value and scale of these improvements we are making in consideration for bonus density are unprecedented in the city's history. Through a direct link between the public improvements delivered and density, bonuses, uh, density bonus granted, this plan balances the infrastructure needs of the public with the economic objectives of the developer. And this approach helps to preserve the district's history, allowing us to design one Vanderbilt to respect the terminal and other historic neighbors and utilize air, air rights transferred from the Bowery Savings Bank building at 110 East 42nd Street, a landmark building that was also restored by S.L. Green. We believe one Vanderbilt serves as a blueprint to other developers for the vast amount of public improvement required for bonus density. This is, in my opinion, the future of unsubsidized market rate commercial development in Manhattan. Since we've begun the public review process in October, we engaged in a robust and productive discussion about this project. 
Thank you to Planning Commission Chair Carl Weisbrod, the City Planning Commissioners, Borough President Brewer, for, and the members of the Multi-Board Task Force, and to our partner organizations at the Coalition for a Better Grand Central, all of whom support improving the commute for the hundreds and thousands of riders that use the terminal each and every day. Now I would like to introduce our team's next presenter, the lead design architect for the One Vanderbilt Project, Jamie Von Klemperer. Uh, hello, I'm James Von Klemperer, design principal, Cohen Patterson Fox. Our offices are just a few blocks away from the site. So to look at the site, reinforce the point that city planning made just a moment ago about the fact that this red site, marked in red, is at the very center of one of New York's two great transit hubs, and the argument for high-density um, development right near the place of transit only makes sense, not only in New York, but worldwide. This is a trend. Also, along this belt of 42nd Street reside some of the great pieces of architecture of Manhattan's high-rise building type, that includes the Times Tower, One Bank America, and of course the Chrysler Building. You can see here from this diagram that rather than choosing an architecture of a boxy nature, we've chosen for strategic reasons to emphasize the tapering of the tower so that light and air can come down to the street below for the enjoyment and the well-being uh, of the neighborhood. Next. and so. You can see here in a, a uh, wooden model showing the proposed tower adjacent to Grand Central Terminal, but also pairing in a way with the Chrysler Building so there is, there is a sympathetic kind of a relationship between these two slender forms bracketing the open space created by the low and capped height, the landmark of the terminal. Now, the next. The, view from the viaduct looking back along 42nd Street at the base of this building demonstrates a kind of openness of the architecture in gesturing uh, a welcoming space uh, facing the more closed architecture of the stone box of Grand Central Terminal. Next. Or looking from Madison Avenue and 42nd Street intersection back towards the east, towards Grand Central Terminal, because of the way this building appears to lift itself up visually and present a series of transparent and open spaces, one can now see or will be able to see the corner of the terminal that had been buried or has been buried visually from this prospect from view for the last 100 years. Next. Coming out of the Kitty Kelly ramp at the southwest corner of Grand Central Terminal, one will be able to see then this rather open aspect of a glass atrium, of commercial space, uh, retail space, and of the entry to the office tower itself. It is meant to be a very visually welcoming, open, transparent experience. Next. The material of the shaft of the tower, the body of the building going all the way up to the top, will be clad in its larger spandrel horizontal area shown on the left with a cream-colored, warm, textured terracotta material. This is in order to present a kind of harmonious response to the more historically appreciated buildings, such as the Lincoln Building, in this station district, as well as to create a relation, material relationship with Grand Central Terminal. Next. And then facing from the northeast, from the Port Cocher of Grand Central Terminal, back towards the building we see in, in early rendering form with a green wall potential or some other artwork, a space which would be designated as a transit hall, a publicly accessible space, and the team has taken great care to work closely, of course with city planning, but also with community board to talk about the most effective public use of this space to everybody's benefit. Next. And then finally, this cutaway section perspective diagram shows you the strategic hinge pin that this public space within the tower's footprint uh, and how it will function to bring together transit and public use from the left-hand side, from the terminal, and then from below, east side access to the right. So it is truly 
a public amenity uh, within this private tower. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Rob Schiffer, Managing Director at SO Green Realty Corp. Thank you, Chair Weprin and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to outline the public improvements and benefits we are proposing as part of our plan for One Vanderbilt. One Vanderbilt is a 30 FAR building that utilizes both a transfer of air rights from a landmark and the proposed public realm improvement bonus. Concurrent with the development of the building, SO Green is proposing to finance and construct Grand Central's highest priority capital needs identified by the MTA and the Department of City Planning. A world-class team of professionals estimates that these improvements will cost $210 million, a number verified by the MTA. However, this is not a $210 million cash contribution into some district improvement fund. We are constructing these improvements with our contractors, and we are responsible for cost overruns and on-time delivery. In fact, one Vanderbilt's tenants cannot occupy the bonus space until the improvements are complete. Most importantly, as you'll soon see, these improvements deliver value above and beyond their cost to New York City's residents and commuters. The first component of the improvement package is off-site at the 456 Grand Central subway station. Peak hour 4-5 trains are over capacity and Grand Central is the bottleneck. Overcrowding on the platform prevents riders from disembarking, causing the trains to remain in the station and causing delays up and down the entire line from the Bronx to Brooklyn. Here's an all too familiar scene. Large column enclosures and wide stairwells create pinch points, making it very difficult for commuters to disembark from a train. Painful to watch. <laughs> so how do we solve overcrowding? We can't move the tracks and we can't widen or lengthen the platforms. New York City transit engineers have studied the problem and identified a four-pronged solution that Essel Green will implement to alleviate overcrowding. First, we'll reduce those wide column enclosures and we'll optimize staircases to maximize the amount of pedestrian circulation space on the platform. Second, we'll add stairs to the north and south ends of the platform to distribute commuters more evenly. Third, on the mezzanine level, will eliminate physical and visual obstacles that prevent commuters from accessing underutilized and less crowded portions of the station. Finally, we'll add and improve street access to those underutilized portions. The net result is one more peak hour train through the station. Here you can see the existing situation with wide columns and wide stairwells, and that's what it looks like as improved. Next, you'll see the areas on the mezzanine that are physical and visual obstacles, and here's what it looks like as improved. Again, the net result is one more train per peak hour through the station, a significant accomplishment that adds valuable time for New Yorkers at, to spend at work or with their families. The next package is on-site. When Eastside Access comes online, it will bring half of Penn Station's riders into Grand Central, doubling the number of commuters that pass through the terminal. One quarter of those riders want to head to points south, southwest, or to make transit to transit connections. Without one Vanderbilt, these riders will enter into Grand Central Terminal through the crowded dining concourse and use the same stairs, ramps, and escalators currently used by Metro North riders. Per the MTA's own EIS, this will result in levels of service that are completely unacceptable. One Vanderbilt is uniquely situated to solve this problem creating a direct connection from east side access to 42nd Street and the subway station, allowing that wave of east side access riders to reach their destinations without entering into the terminal. We'll also ease a burden of shuttle riders by providing a direct connection from the shuttle platform to the street, and we'll also create, as Jamie mentioned, a place for commuters, tourists, and the community to meet and rest in a new public transit hall. Rather than bore you, trying to explain these diagrams that we have, please sit back and grab some popcorn.
a view of one Vanderbilt from across 42nd and Vanderbilt, and the two access points into the transit system, the transit hall and the 42nd Street view of Bestville. Commuters are colored by uh, our origin, so light blue and dark blue represent east side access. We're now at 43rd Street looking at the transit hall. East side access is below. Almost 6,000 people per peak hour will be using this access point and these escalators to connect to points south and southwest. Here's our direct connector, which connects east side access and 42nd Street and the subway station. Some 8,000 people will be using this connection each peak hour. Without it, these people will be using the Kitty Kelly ramp and other crowded areas of Grand Central Terminal. Here's the direct connection to the 456 and the shuttle, as well as direct connection from the shuttle platform up through those stairs and escalators to 42nd Street. And here's what those spaces will look like. Translance, translucent panels in the lobby let daylight in. Color palette and material are consistent with Grand Central Terminal. And this is a view of the transit hall, an iconic glass jewel box with soaring ceiling heights, places to sit, and a train board. Finally, open space. We all know that Midtown East is devoid of public open space. Sidewalks are congested and the bus lanes on Madison do not help. Vanderbilt Avenue, already underutilized, serves as a parking lot for the MTA and is ripe for repurpose. One Vanderbilt will increase the adjacent Madison Avenue sidewalk by over 50%, and SL Green will create an iconic public plaza between 42nd and 43rd Street that will serve as a new front door to Grand Central. Here's what the sidewalk looks like today, and here's what it looks like as improved by one Vanderbilt. Here's Vanderbilt Avenue today. As Council Member Gronick has said, it feels like a back alley. And here's our vision for the plaza. Design elements are embedded in the hardscape, allowing for maximum pedestrian flow and emergency vehicle access. And here's what the plaza might look like at night. As you can see here, we have a unique opportunity to restore grandeur to Grand Central. Finally, the economic benefits of One Vanderbilt are great. We will create 5,200 construction and 190 permanent, good-paying, middle-income jobs with the unions that power the real estate and construction industries. As others will describe in more detail shortly, one Vanderbilt will utilize programs that ensure diversity in its workforce. And One Vanderbilt will generate $42 million of annual incremental real estate taxes, a six-time increase over what's in place today. In order to move the, move, meet the move-in date of our anchor tenant, we must begin structural demolition this fall, begin to go vertical in 2017, and complete the building in 2020, coincident with the completion of our public improvements. One Vanderbilt has overwhelming support from a broad-based group that you'll hear from today, including the major unions, transit rider advocacy groups, and civic groups, who all have a vested interest in seeing One Vanderbilt and its substantial public improvements realized. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, Chair Weprin, members of the council, uh, I'm Stephen Lefkowitz from the law firm of Freed Frank, uh, representing the developer S.L. Green this morning and I'm here to describe the three applications for special permits that are before this committee. The first is an application under Section 81635, an existing provision of the zoning resolution, permitting transfer of unused development rights from a landmark in the Grand Central subdistrict to a receiving site within the subdistrict. And here, the transfer is for 2.63 FAR from the landmark Bowery Savings Bank across 42nd Street. As part of its application, uh, Bowery entered into a restrictive declaration with the Landmarks Commission requiring it to perform certain restoration work on the landmark and to maintain the landmark in perpetuity. The restoration work was completed several years ago, has been signed off by the Landmarks Commission, and the applicant has met all of its obligations with respect to the landmark Bowery. The next two applications are for special permits under the new zoning text for the Vanderbilt Corridor, which has been described to you. The first is for a special permit under Section 81641 for a bonus of 12.37 FAR for construction of a menu of public realm improvements, which have been described to you in detail by Rob Schiffer, the previous speaker, transit improvements, the public plaza, the transit hall. 
Uh, these improvements, the improvements uh, for the subways have been conceptually approved by the MTA, which has so <laughs> declared in a letter to uh, City Planning Commission, and the MTA will speak here today about the need for these improvements and their importance for the transit system. The creation of the public plaza on Vanderbilt Avenue has been conceptually approved by DOT. The specific design for this plaza will be done through a separate public process managed by DOT involving the community board and approved by the Public Design Commission. The public plaza is still a street, that is to say it's still owned by the city, it's still on the city map, it is being pedestrianized and the design for that pedestrian use will be managed by DOT. However, the construction will be done and paid for by the developer. Uh, the City Planning Commission has found that this menu of public improvements meets the exacting standards in the new text and that it merits a bonus of 12.37 FAR sought by the applicant and noting in passing that these public improvements are magnitudes greater than any bonus improvements undertaken in the past. The final special permit is under new section 81642 to provide waivers from certain bulk regulations for the new building including street wall conditions, height and setback regulations, retail continuity, et cetera. These waivers result from the specific design of the new building, which you have seen. Jamie Von Klemper described that to you. It's, temper, it's tapered form, the angled corner at 42nd Street and Vanderbilt Avenue to provide better views of the terminal. The building has been crafted to maximize light and air to the street below and to provide a special relationship and deference to Grand Central Terminal, the most prominent building obviously in the area, and also to provide some of the public improvements like the new subway entrance on 42nd Street and the transit hall on 43rd Street. The building design really is constructed in order to maximize its benefit at this location and hence the waivers of the regulations. Uh, and I will be glad to respond to any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. Do you want to add something, Mr. Holliday? Or? No, that uh, concludes it. I know more than, if you have questions, we certainly Thank you. Yes, I'm entertain. sure there will be a number of questions. I'll actually get started because I just wanted to get clear in my head some things. Um, Mr. Holliday or any member of your team. So could you describe, is this, the 2013 plan that we had talked about, how, how, did, does this, how does this differ, if at all, from the 2013 building as far as what you're building, the FAR? Um, and the transit improvements? Well, I think that the, the bulk of the difference lies in the transit improvements and the connectivity between uh, all three access points, Grand Central, East Side Access, and the subway. We've worked with the extra time and through expenditure of far more money than uh, we had contemplated back in 2013, uh, we've made a series of refinements um, to that plan that Rob can tell you about. Most notably, I think, is the 42nd Street uh, vestibule has been made uh, much larger and, you know, much more of an important feature point of the access to complement the transit, um, uh, the public transit hall on 43rd Street. And, you know, there were also design changes that were made along the way, which were really done hand in hand with the community boards to try and put the building into even more context with Grand Central and the neighborhood and the landmark important, you know, the, the landmark rich nature of this, uh, of this neighborhood. So there were uh, sacrifices made, if you will, towards uh, retail in favor of even better design on the uh, southeast corner of the property where we <coughs> kind of took the bulk down and, and, and pushed, the, uh, pushed the building back somewhat from where it used to reside and changes to the lobby area uh, to create direct connectivity to the public transit hall, uh, which didn't used to exist, and also to put a feature on it, which w with certain bronze and metal elements um, communicate better with, with Grand Central Terminal. So those are, those are some of the, uh, the items that I think, as I said, were made, were made at great cost, uh, but I think made for a better property and for better public benefits. 
Okay. And, and the Vanderbilt corridor will have no vehicle traffic except for emergency vehicles under this plan? Well, only the, the portion that we're looking to make a plaza between 42nd and 43rd Street would be closed for exclusive use by pedestrians other than for emergency vehicular traffic. Got it. Um, watching Mr. Schiffer's uh, video, um, the, last, uh, the one with the colored-coded people, it seemed like some uh, science fiction movie, futuristic science fiction movie, <laughs> when someday we'll all be color-coded and where we come from. <laughs> um, but a little frightening. Uh, but let me ask this question, maybe it's city planning that answers it. You know, one of the great things about this plan, which we're happy about, I know Councilman Garodnik and many people were concerned that under the old plan, people were paying money into a fund but the improvements were coming after the buildings, and people were really concerned about that. How are we going to get all these uh, com commuters to where they have to go? So that's great about this plan, that the money's coming, the improvements are coming before the building. However, um, once this building goes up, once future buildings go up, is there a concern that even though we're making all these great improvements, that you won't be able to accommodate all these different colored people? <laughs> in his video. <laughs> <laughs> well, we think it's very important to have the opportunity to uh, provide for additional improvements in the Vanderbilt corridor. So as you know, of course, the text applies to all five blocks. We think that's essential because there are each of these blocks provide unique and special um, ability to connect to the transit network. These five blocks also provide the opportunity for the landmark TDRs, um, and, and a, pr a project could seek both, could seek both a bonus by providing transit improvements or, uh, you know, seek additional floor area through landmark TDRs. We will hear more from the MTA later. They have articulated other needs in the area um, that could be undertaken uh, by other developers in the area and perhaps in East Midtown. Um, depending on the future recommendations of, of, of the steering committee. Yeah, we, we will be hearing from MTA. Actually, we're probably going to bring them up next uh, after we're done with this panel to, to talk about the specific improvements into such an important part of the discussion today. So we'll, we'll bring them up, I know. Now, I just, I'm just curious, as long as I have you here, though, you mentioned the other buildings. So what kind of improvements do you see bes besides having access from the buildings? Uh, what are you, what are, what would you, what's your wish list or what's the wish list that MTA is going to come with to um, about what improvements you would see for those plazas in that area over there? There are a variety of improvements that we're looking for and we've, con we've uh, structured our special permit so that it can accommodate the wide variety including at grade, below grade, off site and on site. You know, we don't have a crystal ball to determine exactly, exactly what uh, the specifics of those improvements should be. We think it's very important to maintain flexibility so as you know, the, we meet mm -hmm. the future, we can meet the future needs. Um, I do want to say, again, I, I probably did not emphasize this enough, this is precisely where density belongs. We are at transit. We are already, we are at the city's densest job center. We think that this is exactly where high density growth should be located. And they should come with improvements to the public realm. I'm going to turn it over to Councilman Garodnik, uh, who had some questions, he said, right? Uh, he's been working very long and hard on this. I do want to point out we've been joined by very important people, people wearing T-shirts with Hotel Trades Council on it. So that's always good to see, something we didn't see last time. Uh, Councilman Garodnik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to first direct my questions to city planning, and then I have some questions for the, uh, uh, the applicant uh, from uh, SL Green. Um, some of the concerns that have been raised by the community, and certainly I have raised a number of these too, uh, relate to how best to measure the public improvements relative to the density bonuses here. Um, and that's issue one. Issue two is the concern that if we afford the opportunity to go to 30 FAR along a five block stretch, will that presume that a 30 FAR stretch of buildings will result. So let's talk about each of those, because I think that they're important and they're important for us to cover today. Help us understand um, how uh, we can feel certain here that what is being proposed at one Vanderbilt is satisfactory to uh, entitle them to a 30 FAR building and 
along those same lines, how will my colleagues, this will likely happen after I am term limited, but how will my colleagues determine whether or not future projects that are coming down the pike here are similarly entitled or less entitled to those sorts of density bonuses? Thank you, council member. Um, it's very important to stress that each and every application that is seeking significant increase in FAR in the Vanderbilt corridor is going through discretionary review. So that means case by case, individual review of each application, which gives the City Planning Commission and the City Council great authority in, in determining the um, merits of the application and whether the application in the case for the public improvement bonus merits the floor area bonus. Um, this is a long-standing practice uh, that, that we you know, at City Planning and City Council um, have uh, done for decades. Um, and it's delivered many amazing buildings and superior projects you know, throughout the city. Um, I named some of them earlier uh, when we talked about example of the subway improvement bonus. Um, it is a qualitative review, of course. There are not uh, uh, formula or uh, numeric metrics uh, for the City Planning Commission and the City Council in determining the floor area bonus. We think it's very important to maintain the qualitative review and the, uh, the authority to have that qualitative review. Um, to guide the City Planning Commission and the City Council, the text, as we proposed, has very exacting and demanding findings. So you must find that these um, improvements, as proposed by the developers, you know, must be, just to name a few qualities, you know, um, uh, they must materially improve the experience of the commuter moving through the station. They must be uh, generously, uh, dime in dim they must be generous in dimension. They must uh, greatly enhance uh, movement. Um, we have uh, the findings that we are proposing are the most robust and the most rigorous we have in any special permit available in in the zoning resolution. Okay. <laughs> I don't think that was a response to your answer. Okay, yeah, that's, that's not part of my answer. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I hadn't had lunch. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> You want okay, so, so in response, uh, if I understand you correctly, uh, the, the existence of a qualitative as opposed to a quantitative review for such matters is something that is um, part of what city planning does and the council does on a regular basis. Um, and it is spelled out, you say, in the text, which of course we will be looking at closely as we go through our portion of the process as to uh, what demanding findings are actually required to be able to achieve those density improvements. Um, let's talk about that canyon of 30 FAR buildings. Um, you know, not all sites along Vanderbilt are necessarily equal. Um, you know, there is a, a concern that was articulated by the Tri-Board Task Force and others that this will result in an inevitable 30 FAR canyon. Do you want to... Uh, address that? Not every application will seek the full uh, floor area bonus amount, and not every application may receive the full FAR requested amount. It will be determined on the case-by-case -case basis. And, you know, the City Planning Commission and the City Council will have to review each building, make sure that it is not um, deleteriously affecting its surrounding neighbors and the, and the streets. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a Full 30 FAR Canyon is, well, number one, is probably unlikely since there, there are some buildings, uh, to, to name one, the 383 Madison building that is, you know, quite significant and probably will not come down. Um, but then there are some other sites, uh, the MTA site we mentioned earlier, which is a half block, which may or may not be able to reach 30 FAR. And uh, perhaps in the future, the Roosevelt Hotel site, um, there's no known development plan for uh, that site. Uh, but in the case that they were to seek a special permit for an increase for floor area, they would have to make the case that, they, uh, that the design of the building and that the improvements of the building, so the specifics of that proposal merit the floor area increase. So do you think uh, that it will be appropriate for us here and also in future sites to 
uh, to consider the attributes of the site itself in making these determinations? Yes, absolutely. Okay, let me run through with you a few possible uh, areas that we might want to consider here or elsewhere, and you can tell me whether you think that these should be components in our, in our thought process here and in the future. Uh, dual avenue frontage with wide streets. Very fair. That's something we look at at zoning. You know, avenue, uh, frontage on avenue generally has different treatment than frontage on a side street. How about direct access to east side access? I believe every one of the sites along this corridor has the opportunity for direct access to East Side Access. So you would say that that's a, a fair thing for us to consider here? Sure. Okay. And you know what, why don't you either do it again or have Edith... Uh, I'll do it this yes. time. Okay. Do it this time and name yourself. All, uh, Frank Rochella, Deputy Director for Zoning. All of the sites in the Vanderbilt Corridor have the opportunity to connect to East Side Access, which sits directly below. Um, the, M the one Vanderbilt site is proposing to do that. The MTA site, as part of its RFP, is requiring it. Um, kind of the future plans of other sites would need to be determined at the time, but they would all have the opportunity to do that. So a fair consideration in future, or current and future applications. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. How about direct adjacency to the subway system? You know, direct adjacency here is uh, an interesting concept because there's so much interconnectivity. So while the um, a site may not sit directly atop, you know, the Lex Line subway station, it is connected to the Lex Line subway station. So, um, you know, I think it's all connected here. When we talk about connecting the transit network, we talk about connecting to the rather vast network underneath Grand Central. So you don't think there's a way to make a distinction between connecting to the network and connecting directly into uh, a station? Frankly, I think it's a distinction we do not want to make because we think that connectivity is really important and to have it be expansive. So um, again, our special permit is structured so that off-site improvements are allowed to qualify for bonus, and we want to make sure that remains the case. Okay, how about direct adjacency to the Grand Central, what I've heard referred to as the air park, the sky plane, the fact that you have uh, a low building right, uh, right across the street? Again, I think that the way that the permit is structured is not only is it about the improvements, but about the building itself, right? And the building's location, where it is, and what the build, how it relates to those, how to how it relates to those contexts. So I think the permit is structured to allow that to be considered already. And you think that that's a fair consideration for I, making? I, I think these as decisions? someone would look at a future application, they would look at that, and should look at that. I, I, yes, I think okay. that's how we define it. Okay. How about uh, adjacency to a public plaza? We have one as proposed here. Presumably that is part of the consideration for city planning in, in the overall context of uh, the 12.83 um, bonus that's being uh, suggested. Would you say that that is a fair thing to consider? As as a site criterion or as a part of the improvement package? Yeah. Well, really what I'm asking you about all of these mm -hmm. is what potential attributes of a site mm -hmm. could qualify it for additional density or should qualify it potentially for additional density. And I'm asking whether that's one of the component parts that you think we should be looking at as a council and a city as part of the Vanderbilt rezoning. Mm. Maybe less so. Yes, less so. I, I, I think that's a, it's an, it would be an unusual precedent. Um, I think you know we certainly look at uh, the effect of any proposal on the adjacent streets and sidewalks, and certainly if that street or sidewalk is also a plaza, we, we, we look at that uh, very closely. Um, I, I don't know if, if establishing adjacency to a plaza is necessarily a, a useful criterion in terms of determining whether floor area bonus should be available. Okay. Uh, and how about the existence of a full city block site as opposed to a half a block or a quarter of a block? I think that's a very um, key factor in, in the determination of the design and the massing of the building. And as 
you know, the decision makers are reviewing the building, they are looking at how, again, how the building affects the adjacent streets and sidewalks. So uh, certainly a full block site does afford greater flexibility and greater, frankly, greater ability to accommodate more FAR. Um, but, you know, we've seen uh, examples of, of high density buildings on on smaller blocks on, on lots less than 43,000 square feet. So again, uh, I think it, it, it it does warrant a case-by-case -case review. I, I just as, in addition to that, I think that also, in some respects, relates to the use that's proposed for the building. Um, an office building has higher floor-to-floor -floor heights, is, is kind of has other mechanical space. Um, other uses uh, don't have those requirements and have lower floor-to-floor -floor heights. So one could be looking at one building at, one at the same density and be a radically different size and shape of a building. Um, and a hotel or kind of mix with residential as a use, for example, uh, could easily fit on a smaller site at these densities and not have the same difficulty of fitting it as an office building, which, as I, in my earlier presentation, talking about things like the additional elevators and the additional stairs that are required for an office building just require a different site. But again, at that, that's the kind of consideration at a case-by-case -case basis. Got it. We understand the value of case-by-case. -case. We understand your point. And I'm just trying to uh, just narrow down a little bit some of the factors that we will be looking into on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think in your answer, I heard you say yes in response to my question, which is that the size of the site actually would be a factor that city planning and the council should look at here and in future applications. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, the next uh, area that I wanted to talk to you all about is uh, the public plaza. And as initially announced by, back in, in the Bloomberg administration, there was a very uh, dramatic image of Vanderbilt Avenue from 42nd to 47th Street completely closed off to traffic as a full five-block pedestrian plaza. That, of course, is not what is being proposed here. Uh, we have a single block uh, that would be in front of one Vanderbilt. But does the city have a position as to whether or not the public plaza should be extended um, past 43rd Street to the north? At, at this point, no, we do not have a position. I think it's, uh, we're very excited about the prospect of this one block uh, being transformed into a pedestrianized zone, especially since this block is immediately adjacent to one of the busiest entry and egress points at Grand Central Terminal. We all know that corner entry. Um, I think uh, it's very, we're all very excited about this public plaza, and we'll see from there. Um, there could be future opportunity for uh, further pedestrianization of Vanderbilt Avenue, but I think uh, we'll, we'll have to see as, as, as time passes. Okay. Uh, the, uh, and of course, there are, are, there are all sorts of logistical questions present yes. uh, there, which have been articulated by a number of property holders down the, down the block. Um, and, uh, but I do think that the one that is being proposed, at a minimum, is one that certainly that works between a building and, uh, and Grand Central. Uh, the design review process for that one block, mm -hmm. this was the subject of significant discussion at the borough president level. Tell us what is currently the anticipated process for design review of that single block between 42nd and 43rd. You can go, yeah. um, so, uh, it will continue to be city on I want space. you I want you to speak to General Washington behind me, okay? And okay. you're talking to him. All right. Look, General you don't Washington. have to look at Dan. He doesn't need you to look at him. <laughs> it's a Monday. Um, so the it will be continue to be city on space as part of a, as part of the public place designation. Uh, DOT has a plaza program uh, that it uses to uh, design public spaces. Um, it has as kind of throughout the city. Uh, this space, uh, DOT has requested that this space go through that process too. It includes public outreach, it includes design, um, consultation, and that's the intention here. Um, in addition, the, require, the space will be required to go to the Public Design Commission for approval there. Um, and DOT's position on spaces like this is that these be designed at the time, or close to the time of actual construction. Um, so while we're here sitting in 2015, the idea is that the space would actually go through that public design process. Closer to construction, I think their view was somewhere 2017, 2018. Okay. Uh, uh, the, is that better? I think Washington heard you. Oh, my. Um, <laughs> the funding for maintenance 
Uh, this is a discussion that also came up at the borough president uh, level. Um, and as I understand it, you can correct me if I, I got it wrong, there was a certain commitment of uh, funds from the property developer toward the maintenance of that plaza. My question for city planning is how exactly that will work in terms of the uh, operation of the funds to activate the plaza and whether you believe it is sufficient funding to make this an exceptional public place. Well, I, I would have SL Green address the, um, 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 the uh, contribution that you made for the uh, future maintenance, but I just also wanted to note that this uh, public plaza is, of course, within the Grand Central Partnership bid boundaries and as such would be part of the family of public spaces that would be um, under its purview. That's not to speak to the uh, maintenance funding, but just to mention that uh, that a bid is very much involved in the uh, stewardship of that space. Mr. Holliday, you may be able to just answer this as yeah. how exactly it will be, you know, where the money goes right. and how exactly it's going to be uh, um, allocated and used. Mm -hmm. I, I think we've worked it out. It's pretty straightforward. We're going to build and construct. Um, we will be responsible for day-to-day -day maintenance via the Grand Central Partnership, who will actually be carrying out those duties. And then we're going to put up a $500,000 reserve for capital replacement over what's projected to be the useful life of the, uh, of the plaza, which hopefully if we do our job right, you know, won't even be necessary, but things happen. So those are the three components of how it gets built, maintained, and, and, and kept at its original standard. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, back to city planning for a moment. Um, on the pedestrian circulation requirements, uh, as you noted in your uh, testimony, and by the way, chairs, uh, if, if you wish to break in at any point, I, I have a, a bunch, but obviously I will, you tell me when the moment is. Um, you propose to modify the landmark transfers in the Grand Central Subdistrict so that the infrastructure or pedestrian circulation re improvement requirement is uh, entirely at city planning's discretion and can be waived. Um, and for just to put that in simple language for those who may not be zoning experts, Previously, there was a requirement that if you transfer air rights from a landmark that you're required to do pedestrian circulation improvements. City planning is proposing to make that a discretionary point so that city planning can say that is required or not required in your case-by-case -case situation. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could explain the rationale behind that a little bit, I think that uh, Certainly, you know, my constituents would like to know that almost no matter what you are doing on development in that area, that there will be obligations on you to do pedestrian circulation improvements, other improvements in Grand Central, which of course we will demand on a case-by-case -case basis, but why not leave that in here as one of the component parts? We view that requirement for an infrastructure improvement as part of a landmark transfer to be an unfair burden to that landmark transfer transaction. Normally, with a landmark TDR uh, special permit in another section called 74 or 79, there is not that requirement to uh, provide, to implement an infrastructure improvement on top of purchasing the development rights from a landmark, from an adjacent landmark. The, this requirement that's in the Grand Central subdistrict is one of the reasons why we think the Grand Central Subdistrict Special Permit for Landmark Transfer has not worked. In its 20 years of existence, it's only been used once. There was one development that went for the Landmark TDR uh, Special Permit it, because, in part, because, uh, because uh, excuse me, there was only one project that went for that special permit, and after that, none, because in part of that infrastructure improvement requirement. We think it's really important to eliminate it and bring it uh, to um, a, a policy standard that we have for other landmarks. Of course, an infrastructure improvement, if deemed absolutely necessary for that site, can be required as part of the special permit process. So it's to maintain the flexibility of um, requiring it 
uh, or allowing for other um, component infrastructure parts to take its place. Is that a fair? Yes, there will be that flexibility. We are eliminating as an outright requirement, but we are a lot, we are keeping it as a potential uh, uh, element that is required by the discretionary review of City Planning Commission Council. Dan, um, Councilmember Greenfield has a follow-up on that same question you just asked, if that's okay. Councilmember Greenfield. Thank you, Mr. Gorodnik. I, so yeah, on this particular uh, issue, I was curious about that as well. I'm, I'm, I mean, aren't really what we're doing is we're sort of um, allowing developers in the future, right, to basically try to pit city planning imp improvements versus the potential cost of a transfer of the ear rights, right? Isn't that really what's going to happen as a result? No, we see these as uh, alternatives, but also you can use these special permits in combination. So an, a future applicant um, could go for a floor area bonus through the floor area bonus special permit and also seek the landmark TDR. We actually think that future developers will opt for the landmark TDR special permit because it is um, a, in many way, a much more straightforward process in that there is not the uh, identification of infrastructure improvements, working with the, you know, the city and the MTA to establish what those improvements are and the timing of those improvements. As you have heard from the SL Green team today, they are on the hook for the implementation and any cost overruns. There is a high degree of risk in undertaking infrastructure improvements. We think that future developers will readily opt for a special permit where yeah. there's uh, simply a transaction oh, think, to purchase development rights. I think we, I think we agree, Councilman Bergrodnik, and I think that's actually uh, our concern, uh, which is what you mm -hmm. have so clearly articulated. To be fair, I, I'm very comfortable with the current project being proposed, and I think the developers have gone to extraordinary lengths to uh, accommodate the community and to make it a, uh, a very significant improvement by any objective standard. I think uh, our greater concern, although I'm sure the council member has issues on the projects that he'd like to discuss as well, is the precedent going forward. And uh, to a certain extent, by, by no longer requiring uh, these improvements attached to the air rights, effectively, uh, really what we're doing is we're creating sort of a, a, a very simple bargaining situation where developer comes in and figures, okay, what's it going to cost me to make improvements versus what's it going to cost me to get the air rights? And they'll make the decisions based on that and not necessarily the improvements, which I think is something that we all agree we want to encourage. So I sort of share Councilman Bergrodnik's concern, and that's why I wanted to hone in on it, and that's sort of my perspective. What say you? We have... Uh more than one public policy goal here and, and the city, we can establish and we do establish uh, multiple zoning mechanisms to achieve those different goals. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there is uh, about approximately 1.5, actually now 1.35 million square feet of unused development rights from landmarks in the area. Um, that number, it, it's, it could be extinguished over you know, a handful of projects. Um, at the same time, you know, we have projects that are sitting atop of this incredible transit network. So we do foresee that developers, in many cases, will, will choose to plug into the networks. It brings great value to their own property, but we also see instances, probably most instances, where the public will demand and the public decision makers will also require that plugging into the transit network is part of that proposal. So just a final point on, on, you mentioned that this was one of the issues with the uh, transfer of air rights. Isn't it also fair to say that uh, due, to the fa due to the location of where these air rights are located that some folks may have en engaged in speculative purchase of air rights and have therefore hoarded it, and as a result maybe that also didn't uh, allow for development uh, to take place in the same fashion that perhaps you anticipated? And is there anything that you're doing on that end to prevent that uh, particular scenario? 
Let, let me, I, I don't think I totally understood your question. So would you repeat that, please? Or I wish we had a transcription. <laughs> okay, thank you. Over here. Okay. I, I, my point is, I don't think that the only reason that developers haven't, that the developers mm -hmm. haven't, I, I would disagree with your point, which mm -hmm. is that you're saying that developers decided uh, not to develop and that you couldn't transfer the earrights because they had to engage in these infrastructure improvements. I'm not convinced that's the case. Okay. I think that uh, as, as, as a result, what ended up happening was that some folks ended up purchasing these air rights speculatively, and they ended up hoarding the air rights, and that's what resulted in a lack of development as opposed to the concern over infrastructure. So I, I uh, it, it, it merely reinforces my point, which is Councilman Bogorodnik's point, is that infrastructure, uh, which we all agree should be at a premium mm -hmm. and is being done in this case under SL Green, uh, that perhaps we should be more considerate of that as part of your corridor rezoning. Okay, thank Mr. Halliday, did you want to add, he may want to add his own comments on this. It looked like you were <laughs> reaching, right? Did you want to add? I, 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 or, not, yeah. so. oh. <laughs> may, may I first just comment? Thank sure. you very much for the clarification. We create zoning proposals irrespective of ownership of, of property or of you know, uh, development rights. So the uh, elimination of the requirement for the infrastructure improvement is something that we have we diagnosed as a problem a long time ago and is something that we have wanted to implement and we see it's the right thing to do and the fair thing to do vis-a-vis -vis other landmark transfer um, policy um, uh, policies. Thank you. Did you want to add something? No, I, I think the council members said it all. Okay. You agree with what the council member said? <laughs> Look, we're in the business of redeveloping and developing properties. And to do that uh, in, a, in an area like Grand Central, uh, which is completely built out, it comes at great cost. So just to do our one project, we had to assemble four different properties starting in 2011, you know, start to think through our planning. Ultimately, we had to buy out <clears throat> and or relocate 191 tenants. And then on top of that, you know, all these uh, subgrade improvements uh, in exchange for the density bonus. So clearly, the costs involved with these transit improvements are, you know, exorbitant, um, but they're necessary. And, you know, we're, we're, we're happy to be making them, whether others, you know, will or won't follow in our footsteps, we'll see. But, you know, hopefully we're laying down a blueprint for the future uh, for doing that. But, you know, it's yet to be seen how many other developers want to travel down that road to get the 30 times uh, FAR because it is not only quite costly, but it also comes um, with the extraordinary risks that were mentioned here earlier about completing the projects on budget, on time to get a TCO. And if you don't, then there's, there's other things that happen from that. So um, if there is another avenue uh, with landmark air transfers, and I think that will be for some an attractive alternative to either do in isolation or do as part of this bonus uh, density uh, transfer uh, mechanisms that are being set up here, you know, hopefully as part of this Euler proceeding. Um, but that does mean you, you need a willing seller of those air rights. And, you know, I think to the extent that as part of, you know, future zoning that other landmark uh, properties are brought into that fray to create a bit of a market as opposed to sole sourcing, I think would go a long ways towards seeing that become a reality in the future. Okay, great. I'm going to go back to Councilman Garadna, who has a, a, some more questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let's talk about landmarks for a moment, uh, because one of the concerns that many of us have about any grand rezoning or even smaller rezoning is that uh, we in our desire to do what we, uh, we all want to do here, which is to create economic opportunities and to uh, get East Midtown unstuck from its uh, unfortunate uh, position today, that we may lose some valued um, historic resources in the process. So I wanted to see if you could speak to the steps that the city has taken uh, to review other sites, either along Vanderbilt Corridor such as Roosevelt Hotel, Yale Club, or others, um, to uh, you know to consider the merits of these properties uh, in advance of uh, what you're asking the council to do here. As part of um, the 
2013 East Midtown proposal, you will recall there was um, uh, participation, very strong participation from Landmarks Preservation Commission to look at the broader area and to determine what the eligible buildings for future landmarking would be. So the discussion was very much at the, you know, was, was very much at the fore of, of that uh, rezoning. And certainly it's something that we're all very sensitive to as we proceed here. Uh, the Landmarks Commission, they are the expert agency on what projects should be uh, calendared uh, for potential future designation. Um, they have been looking at the area. They continue to look at the area. Certainly, this zoning proposal um, and, and the previous proposal have put a, a really a giant magnifying glass on the area. Um, LPC, they've, they have stated that, you know, this is among the richest of landmark districts in all of the city, but with this uh, in increased interest in the area, they are um, revisiting. Uh, I ex we expect to hear from them as part of the Greater East Midtown process, certainly, on what a potential other uh, landmarks there may be in the area. But we defer to them. They are the ex experts on the merits of historic resources and whether they should be landmarks. Well, we certainly are pushing them hard on that point mm -hmm. because we want to make sure that we have that conversation and we have this conversation and it should not be a question of, uh, you know, either uh, uh, putting ourselves in a position that will demolish landmark worthy buildings or efforts to landmark buildings in, in order to inhibit certain developments. We don't want either of those things to happen. We want the purity of the landmarks process and the purity of this process to move forward. Uh, and, uh, and that's the goal, at least, so I, I take your point. Okay, let's talk about the impact of these developments on the skyline and whether or not exceptional design is one of those component uh, demanding findings that you mentioned that are in uh, the text for this, uh, this special permit. It is. Uh, the <laughs> uh, there are findings that, are, that speak to the building both at the ground floor, how it's massed, and how it relates to the overall city skyline. And how about in, uh, environmental standards that we should be looking for here? Sure. So again, uh, actually for the first time in zoning, uh, we have a requirement that a building utilizing these permits or, util or proposing to utilize these permits um, propose a sustainability plan and that that be one of the things that the commission and the council review um, and meet findings about it. Uh, the finding as it was approved by the commission uh, effectively requires that the building meet or exceed best practices in sustainable design practice. Um, that's looked at both through comparable buildings in the city um, and in whatever other means uh, are afforded. Uh, the other thing I think one of the things it's important to remember is last year we had a requirement as part of an as of right proposal and it was really only focused on energy use. I think one of the things we heard was that there's a broader view of what sustainability should be, really focused on things like water use, um, just kind of overall tenancy. And so the proposal, uh, the proposed sustainability requirement is broader um, and is really intended to review the entirety of the building proposal. Okay, all right, so this is gonna be my, my last question for you all before I turn over to Juan Vanderbilt, but it's sort of a transition question because it applies to, to both, which is it seems to me that the uh, the opportunity to do all of the infrastructure improvements that are being proposed as part of one Vanderbilt uh, were only possible because of the active and willing engagement by the MTA. If the MTA had not been ready to discuss these improvements, if the MTA did not have uh, concepts in mind, this would have been a very difficult package of improvements to put together. You need the MTA to do this stuff. So my question for city planning, and then we'll sort of transition over to Mr. Holiday and his team, is you know, how important is it for us to understand the MTA's priorities in advance as we think through the Vanderbilt corridor and even the rest of East Midtown? Um, the, the existence of those plans seem to me to be rather critical uh, but I wanted to get your, your sense as to how you would put that in the context of what we're doing here and beyond. I think it's, yes, we think it's very important to understand what the needs of the MTA uh, is or are. 
um, and we will hear from the MTA later. Um, the MTA, you will also hear from them, they have, um, I think, uh, gotten much more intensive in terms of their efforts to identify needs, you know, throughout the very vast system, but certainly here at, at this key juncture in the city. Certainly, uh, knowing the improvements in advance will, uh, you know, help all our planning efforts, and they certainly will uh, facilitate future special permit actions that are requesting floor area bonus or or perhaps even in the case of a landmark TDR. Um, so we, we, we agree that it's important to understand what the needs are. Because you can envision a scenario which, you know, two, three buildings over, whoever it will be, one building, it doesn't even matter, um, will come and they will say, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. You all have passed a Vanderbilt corridor, which allows for an opportunity to buy from a landmark or do infrastructure improvements per the MTA. What are the improvements that the MTA now needs next on its list? And if those are not articulated or known, then that really is not as real an opportunity. Is that fair? Uh, the opportunity is there, certainly. Um, you were asking about whether the the if you don't know what the if you don't know what the MTA needs, mm -hmm. how do you opt for the infrastructure improvement route on this special permit? It's important to know what the MTA needs are, and they're also you know, and the the universe of possible improvements doesn't necessarily just come from the MTA. They can come from anyone really and they can come from the developer they can come from the city they can come from uh, you know community board stakeholders so um, MTA is I would say a very key probably the key um, uh, informer of the infrastructure improvements uh, but again they can come from they can come from anyone okay uh, so mr. holiday I guess I'll turn that same question yeah. to you and also if you can share with us the process as to how you arrived at the sites that uh, or the improvements that you talked about and what the interaction with the MTA looked like sure I'm gonna you know I'm gonna have Rob uh, Schiffer answer the question about how we negotiated and came to those that set of improvements because he spearheaded that component of it but again as it relates to your question I think that we always looked at it as um, uh, a set of improvements that wasn't limited just to the MTA improvements. They just, at the time, had the biggest need. My understanding is that need for East Midtown uh, could be as big as close to $500 million um, for East Midtown. So I think that while you don't know at the moment what will and won't be on that list in a year or two or three, I think it's fair to say now, and you'll hear from the MTA shortly, uh, how big that list is going into this process. and. You know, and, and knowing that there's only a finite amount of sites within, within this Vanderbilt corridor to satisfy those transit improvements for those that opt to develop and opt to go that route. So um, with respect to, you know, the specific um, components, you know, Rob will hit that. Okay. Sure. It took us almost two years of negotiation to come to this conclusion with the specific set of improvements that we're doing. Uh, on the on-site improvements, the MTA presented an initial plan uh, for access into both the New York City transit system and east side access through the core of our building, which had to be reworked given uh, the difficulties of the building's needs in its core. And so that's why the connection between east side access and the uh, transit system runs along the easternmost edge of the site. Um, for the off-site improvements, the MTA came to us with a significant package, which over uh, the course of, I would say, the past year or so, we negotiated with them to come to this complete package, which specifically addresses the four, five, six constraints and congestion. The big picture question that we have here about density for infrastructure as a new component for this uh, sub-area uh, is one that I asked city planning about, um, Chair Greenfield uh, pushed a little bit too, but m maybe, uh, Mr. Holliday, you can describe from your own perspective how we should quantify uh, the benefit of the infrastructure here um, and why you believe it's worthy of such a, a, a density bonus in your specific application. Well, I, I 
probably think it's worthy of a greater density <laughs> bonus than we're actually <laughs> receiving. If you recall, I've said, you know, on previous occasions, I thought 33 times was more in line with, uh, you know, what would make sense for this kind of, you know, site next to a, a transit center and given the extraordinary amount of transit improvements we're making, but I think that uh, through the process, 30 times was was developed as 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 the maximum uh, attainable, you know, for this. So um, I can only you know think to look at it in two ways. We, we never looked at the cost of the improvements per se, as as it, through the negotiations, um, it was always the scope of improvements, and then we figured out the cost when the scope was settled in deciding what what was economically feasible and what wasn't. So I just want to dispel any notion that the two-year negotiation Rob was talking about was a negotiation about money. It really was about scope and, and improvement. Um, and then, as I said, we came down to cost and then decided whether or not the project could support that cost and or what kind of value engineering we needed to do to the project to make it um, to make it economically feasible, making concessions in certain areas in order to be able to afford not only the cost of these improvements, which, as I said earlier, I'll say again, is unprecedented, as we're told, in, you know, in city planning, uh, um, uh, pre precedent of granting, you know, bonus uh, density for improvements, uh, but also the new features which require the work to be done prior to a TCO. So it adds not just a dollar risk, but a... Uh, but an execution risk. So we had to feel very comfortable in doing this work, uh, not on our own property, all these offsite improvements on time, on budget, in order to get that, that TCO. So it was really at the end of the process when we went through, you know, the amount of scope we could afford to do and couldn't afford to do and what we felt we could take on within our construction time period and what we couldn't take on because it would be outside of that construction time period that we, I guess, finally settled and resolved on a scope that um, was acceptable to the parties. So this is the this is the point that I really want to um, to focus us on for the moment, which is we're in the in a case by case world here with this special permit, uh, and the obvious question that will be posed to the council and to the mayor and everybody else if we were to approve the application for one Vanderbilt is, uh, did you get a good deal for the public? It is obvious that the improvements that are proposed are important, needed, uh, and very impressive. The question is, are we getting a good deal for the public? So what I'd like for you guys to attempt to answer is, how would you answer on our behalf, if we were to approve this, that we know with confidence that this is a good deal as opposed to any other number of improvements or less density or whatever. How do, how do we feel good that this is the right, the right balance between density and infrastructure? You know, um, I think that's really what, what planning in the MTA comes to a conclusion about when the level of improvements are, are sort of obvious and overwhelmingly in, in the favor of, of the public, as I think they are in this case. Um, I think the value of the public benefits exceeds the cost, uh, so that, you know, I wouldn't look at $210 million of improvements as $210 million of value. I think the long-term value to commuters and residents and, uh, and tourists and, and business uh, owners in the area are, 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 are multiples of that in terms of making every day, you know, a, um, uh, you know a, an easier commute, a more timely commute, a more pleasant, um, you know, environment and experience that lasts you know, forever, essentially, or as long as, you know, as long as these improvements last. So I think that, uh, you know, from a public benefit standpoint, I think, I think the metric is relatively um, more straightforward in knowing when you're getting a package of benefits that so vastly uh, exceeds, I think in this case, you know, the, 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 the development benefit being bestowed. So um, I don't know that there's an arithmetic uh, formula for it, but I think that I can tell you, having gone through this process now over the period of the last two to two and a half years, um, it's a rigorous process, and uh, I respect the process, and I think the public is getting a hell of a building and a hell of a set of improvements, and I think 
even if you can't, if you don't have the formula, I think people know it's a good deal for the city, it's a good deal for residents. Dan? Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Councilman Greenfield ask two questions, and then I think he has to run out to a meeting anyway, and we'll get back to you, okay? Councilmember Greenfield. Dan, I have to head to uh, the budget negotiating team, so I'm going to take your proxy with me while you ask the, uh, the rest of these questions. I just wanted to follow up on, uh, on a couple things that were uh, said directly to what uh, Councilmember Grodnick was uh, asking. So, you know, back, back to Edith at uh, city planning, right? I mean, understanding, once again, that it was a two and a half year process, it's rigorous, it's complicated, it's difficult. Does that not concern you as it concerns us that, uh, that, that by, by not having a clear standard, right? I think what you used in your slide was significant pedestrian and transit network improvements, which I think we agree, SL Green is making significant improvements, but for a future developer, it seems a little mushy, shall we say. So does that concern you at all? It certainly concerns us for the future. Does that something that concern you? And then hopping back to what we said before, does that simply incentivize someone to say, hey, you know what, I'm just going to buy air rights and call it a day? We think it's very important to maintain flexibility in the special permit. And, uh, you know, the, excuse me, the improve. Did you kill the mic? Oh. I've killed the mic. Is it working? Yes. Okay. There okay. You thank you. Uh, where was I? Okay. So the improvements, again, we stated earlier, must meet very rigorous and demanding findings as established by the special permit. Um, you had asked whether, uh, excuse me, you had asked uh, because this process. Mushy. Was mushy. The word that I use. We don't, and, we, and I said we don't like mushy. We like that it's flexible. We okay. like that it's flexible. <laughs> yes. I think it's, I think it would be, frankly, I think it would be folly to try to determine in advance every single specific improvement we want on every single site. That, we think, could be more, would serve as a straitjacket. We want to make sure that we maintain some flexibility so we can accommodate the best improvements that the future demands. So, you know, I think it's very helpful to have general plan, general guidelines, general understanding of what the future needs are, but to have a very fine-grained list of specific improvements tied to specific sites could actually render the process uh, more impractic impractical and um, it actually could end up taking more time. Sure. I mean, although to be fair, there is a range between mushy and rigid, and I think we're asking maybe there's little more give in that range. I think, once again, the, the purpose really speaks to Councilman Grodnick's point, which is we want to ensure that these projects are in the public interest, but also we want to make it uh, clearer for developers who are looking to develop in the future, right? You know, uh, un un unfortunately for SL Green, they are the, the guinea pigs in this case, and they had to go through a very rigorous process, and hopefully, as a result, uh, that would make it somewhat easier for the future. And, I know that in some cases it may be their competitors, but still, uh, we'd like to just make the, the playing field a little bit easier. So just something to perhaps think about. My, my other question uh, actually is uh, something uh, that Mr. Holliday mentioned that I actually was curious about myself. How did you come up with the 30 FAR number? I know that uh, around the world, especially uh, in parts of Asia, Dubai, Taipei, Shanghai, we've got much taller structures. What was magical about 30 FAR that you said, this is where we stop? There are a lot of, uh, there were a lot of factors that led to the 30 FAR. You may recall that it was actually the number that we had proposed uh, in, in our 2013 uh, Eastman Town uh, text amendment that you know, through special permit projects around Grand Central Terminal could achieve up to 30 FAR. Um, the 30 FAR, we believe, is, the, is a significant enough increase in floor area to incentivize a developer to undergo the discretionary review, which we all know is, is, is an arduous process. It's a huge commitment of time, energy, and resources, financial certainly. So we, we know that we do have to provide a, a, an adequate enough, a sufficient enough incentive to make sure, to ensure that developers uh, will seek it and that we get the um, improvements. Um, you know, 30 FAR is, is not, is, is a number, 
it's a number, right? But there are projects in the area that are um, approaching 30 FAR. We have, you know, the Chrysler, which is 27, the Lincoln Building, which is 27 FAR. Of course, these are older buildings. They may have lower floor to ceiling heights, so they may not be as tall as, as future buildings. Um, there are also other factors. You know, we looked at the existing special permit, which was 21.6 FAR. We looked at a full block site, which is essentially the largest site you can get on Vanderbilt Corridor. And we did some, um, you know, it's, uh, it, you, you frankly can get an infinite amount, inf infinite variety of massings at, at any FAR. It really depends on the program, on the design, on, on a number of factors. But we believe 30 FAR was, uh, was appropriate for the area, and while it is h higher than what today's special permit allows in the Grand Central Subdistrict, Grand Central District and the East Midtown area, it is an area of global distinction, and we should be allowing for great, significant new buildings here. So 30 FAR, we believe, was well within you know, the, the, the ambitious, but at the same time also, uh, you know, not, not, uh, not a number that was alien, you know, to uh, this central business district area. Edith, I'm not disagreeing with anything you said. I think actually it was a very good description. I'm actually coming at it from the other side and really just trying to understand how city planning comes to make this kind of policy, right? So you hit the nail on the head, and I think we agree with you that uh, this particular district is the most important business district in New York City. We want to make sure continues, we want to make sure it's cutting edge, we want to make sure it's world class. If you look at other business districts throughout the world, there are higher FARs. I'm not advocating it, I'm simply wondering, in this case you had a developer who was willing to go up 10% higher. In other cases, you may have similar situations. How did you decide that 30 is the magic number? So you explained the process, but I'm curious as to why you said we can't go above 30 and you decided to cut it off at that level, considering that this is a world-class destination, and other world-class destinations we have seen in recent years taller buildings. I think we thought stopping at double 15, which was the base FAR, was a good place to be. Um, it was also the highest FAR allowed in the zoning in the resolution is 33 in Hudson Yards. Um, we thought this it made sense to be a little bit lower than that, too. Yeah. Mr. Holiday, you have that itch again. You know, you yeah. Well, to add? I just okay. want to add to okay. it from <laughs> sort of from the business side of things. Um, while I mentioned earlier, 33, I thought you know would be sort of economically optimal. It, there is a limit between 30 and 33. You can differ. Sure. It's not. It's yeah. a very tight band, 10 percent. But um, certainly, much beyond 30, you get into a, a case of diminishing returns from a construction perspective. Um, 30, or right about 30, is where it just so happens you start to um, maximize the yields for a sensible building in terms of good dimensions, reasonable elevator and core structure, floor plates, et cetera. And as you go higher and higher, um, to achieve the same either becomes very, very costly or you start to end up you know, with very, very small floor plates. And uh, it does become you know, not, not optimal, if you would. So again, there may be some some latitude around 30, but it's not, it's not a question of, I don't think, 35 or 40. I mean, there is, sure. I think, just a basic business reason why this number tends to be on a global standard around uh, the number where, where most major new world-class buildings are topping out. And we have one more ad here. Yes. Uh, just uh, to add to Mr. Holliday's comment, uh, from the point of view of architectural design, we have designed some wonderful 100-story structures in Shanghai, Hong Kong, elsewhere. They only make sense at this higher dimension, proportion, et cetera, when they go straight up. So this taper, which is a very important part of the discussion, evolution of design, along with these collaborators or bodies from the city, et cetera, um, would not be possible. Uh, it simply diminishes to a floor plate below 12,000 square foot gross above this point, which is almost at that point unusable. Thank you. OK. okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Greenfield. I'm going to call on Mr. Garodnik again to continue his line of questioning. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman and uh, Mr. Greenfield. You uh, have my proxy. Use it judiciously. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to the transit hall for the moment. 
Um, this has been the subject of a lot of conversation in the community um, uh, as to location of transit hall, size, amenitization. I wanted to see if you could discuss a little bit about uh, what steps SL Green is taking to ensure that it's both accessible and a valued public space, uh, what sorts of programming you know, one might expect when walking into that room, and then I also want to talk to you about the door. So let's, let's start with the first, right, the first part. Sure. <clears throat> the transit hall is located on the northeast corner of the site for a very specific reason, and that is that east side access riders, which as you saw in this simulation, form the majority of the riders that are, or pedestrians that are flowing underneath one Vanderbilt's footprint, are headed to points south and southwest or to make transit to transit connections. That means that they're trying to get to 42nd Street or they're trying to head down to the 456 S or 7 train. So the transit hall was located not at the nexus of where those commuters are looking to head to, because if the transit hall was located there, the mass of people, the crush that you saw, over 6,000 people per peak hour, would make that space not a place of repose, not a place where people could sit, not a place where people could wait. It would end up being a transit hallway, a transit corridor, a transit uh, escalator, so to speak. So the transit hall was located on the northeast corner, away from the direct path of where people are going, so that we could have a place of repose with a train board so that people could wait and use the space as they do Grand Central's main hall, where during rush hour, as you walk through there, you see groups of people, commuters, waiting for their track to be posted, talking to each other. You see tourists enjoying the space, taking it in, and you see some level of concession, coffee, some food, etc. cetera. Um, with respect to the specific concessions that may or may not be available, that's something that we're still uh, examining, and we've agreed to work with the community board and the borough president as we finalize the specific use of the transit hall in the coming uh, months. Why don't you, you throw the council into that mix, too, while you're at it? <laughs> right, exactly. So uh, just uh, as long as you're on the picture again. So the wall, is that part of the plan already? To ha is that a, a living wall? Is that wall live plant life there growing on the wall? Just curious. <laughs> That's one of a number of possibilities. The thought is that a large area devoted to public art could be a bar relief, could be a painting, it could be green wall. Um, green is a little bit uncontroversial, shall we say. It's generally loved, so it's a good placeholder, but it should be, We, I think, all believe something has great visual impact and makes people feel good. Uh, until it gets infested with something, I guess it is on, not controversial. But, all right, Mr. Grodnick, yes. Okay, so one of the arguments for the design of the transit hall is its visual transparency. And I know that there were a uh, number of conversations at the borough president level about uh, where to locate the door. And I, I want to I discuss this with you at this hearing because I think it's an important question and important that we get it right. Uh, the way it is currently envisioned on these diagrams, if I if I understand them correctly, the door is on 43rd Street in these pictures. Is that is that right? In, in these pictures, okay. correct. And it was part of the the conversation with the borough president to move the door onto onto Vanderbilt. Is that right or no? Two two different doors. I think we're, we're okay. Talking so about. help me out. So so the door that was at issue uh, with the borough president was connectivity between the transit hall and our lobby, which I don't know if it's shown there or not, Jamie, but it would be on the left side of the screen leading from the transit hall into our, our lobby, and that change was made. So whether it shows or not, it, it is, there is now that direct connection as opposed to having to exit the transit hall and then circle back in through uh, the main lobby. Um, the second door I think you're referring to is a point of ingress, egress into the transit hall itself. Um, and for that, um, why don't Jamie talk about the current state of where that door is to be located, because we've, we've had it in different locations, and where, where do we have it now? Yes, it, as it had been designed, this was some months ago, as you can see from this image, the major, all of the ingress, egress at grade from the exterior were along 43rd Street. We thought that followed the most advantageous path of commuters and would also leave, as you could see from this image, this rather grand, we felt beautifully monumental 
if you will, uh, visual connection between the Port Cochere Grand Central Terminal and the train hall. And from the converse view, from the inside, would feature this kind of her heroic, if you went even closer, view of these big arched windows and the decorative or architecture of Grand Central Terminal. Um, then I believe the request was made in discussions with um, city planning and others to incorporate some doors rather in this wall demising between the plaza to be and the train hall. That's possible and that's something we're illustrating now, I believe and have in the, sub in the submission uh, <clears throat> for approval. Although um, it's true that I think our, our lingering feeling is uh, that for the sake of uh, the best relationship between the eventual park, the interior space, and the flow of people, it would be better not to have those doors. So um, because we're all after the best solution, I thought it was important to feel simple. Okay, to bring well, let's, that up. Let, since we have the benefit of having the advocates for the the Vanderbilt door at the table, let's let's pose the question to them, because I'm not certain, as I sit here, what the right answer to this one is. Um, it seems to me a question of you know most direct access right off of the plaza versus what is a rather impressive uh, visual and aesthetic uh, outcome. City planning views the importance of the door to be more uh, significant here. So why don't you just ad address that? I think you actually already answered it. The commission felt that having the access between Vanderbilt Plaza and the transit hall right at the same location was actually a good idea. Um, so that, that was their rationale for requiring the door to be there. What, what, difference, what difference does it make if you have the door there versus right, uh, you know, around 10 feet away around the corner? What, what difference does it make? I, I think it was that you could see it very clearly that that's how you know to get in. That was the commission's point of view. And do you think that it's not, it will not be clear as to how to enter um, uh, if you're standing right, you know, with this right here with the, the lady in the white dress as to how to get into that room? I, I, I'm trying to describe the commission's intent, which is that they thought that was the easiest way to do it. If, I don't want to make this a debate to debate because we respect uh, the opinion of those whose, whose opinion governs us. Uh, but if we were to back our view up a little bit and look at the whole uh, east facade of along Vanderbilt, just to the left of this view is the major entry to the office building. Part of our thinking was we don't want people to be confused about whether they're entering a train hall or an office building, to have the office building entry on one side, the train hall on the other, could clarify, especially when you have dozens or hundreds of people uh, walking across, finding their way in the morning or evening. And you also now, with the borough president's proposed improvements that you have adopted, you will be able to access from the lobby into the transit hall, so there is a Vanderbilt Avenue access point to the transit hall through that means too, is that right? That's correct. Okay, well I think we're gonna to have to talk about this one a little further and uh, think about what to do here. Okay, um, I'm gonna finish up. I, I don't have endless amounts of numbers of <laughs> questions here and I appreciate your time, but it's, this is our shot here at the council, so I think it's important. One comment about the improvements uh, with the, um, the color-coded uh, people, it was clear that um, in order to go from east side access to the subway, you have to go up to the concourse level and then back down to the subway. And I think as part of our ongoing conversations, we should uh, consider ways to make that an easier shot. It's something which I think could be easily remedied in this uh, proposal, so I think we should flag that for future discussion. Um, this is a question about um, mitigation uh, identified mitigation for other projects and something which anybody here can answer, but there are a couple of components of this proposal on the transit improvements that were already supposed to be mitigations of other projects. The seven line extension uh, and east side access and those were commitments that were made by the city and the MTA that as a result of these projects, we will mitigate them by doing these things. They're now being picked up by S.L. Green in this proposed development. 
Um, so my question really for city planning uh, and SL Green can add if they wish, but why are we giving density bonuses for improvements that were identified as mitigation for other projects and why is that okay and why should we not be concerned about that as a precedent? Sure. Uh, so let's, just to bring it in perspective, we're talking about a very limited subset of improvements here. Uh, two stairs were requirements for Hudson Yards. One stair was a requirement for um, Eastside Access. In the entirety of all of the of, uh, SL Green's proposal, that's the scale of this. Uh, number two, the improvements that were required as part of the Hudson Yards seven-line extension, the two stairs, were required in the future. They were required far in the future at the full build-out of Hudson Yards. So let's talk 20 years, just to be conservative in the future. Those would be when that would need to be implemented. Here, the proposal brings them into today. And for that alone, uh, we believe that there's an improvement being proposed as part of that. We think there's benefit to having a commuter's entire life be actually able to use the stair rather than have the city wait to develop those 20 years onwards. Um, so from those perspectives, the city thinks we are um, uh, quite safe. Um, on the other end, on the one MTA stair, while the MTA had it as a requirement of a mitigation for their transit project, there was nothing that said they couldn't utilize a other type of project to develop that stair. Um, so th that there's no kind of conflict there. Right. Well, we're, they, we're doing a lot of stuff for the MTA as part of this project, so just add it to the list, I suppose, <laughs> right? Okay. So uh, let's talk about the lobby and the, uh, the requirement for through block access, because that is something which is part of the application uh, here, which is uh, waiving the requirement that there be through block access in the lobby of one Vanderbilt. Can you address why that's necessary here and why you, you ask for a waiver? Jamie, you want to do it? Yep. Um, in fact, there are entries to the building on both Vanderbilt and Madison, so there is a path of travel. Um, but it's really for the sake of security that that takes you directly into the core, uh, the elevator core, and therefore, you know, with today's use of office buildings, uh, you'd have to invite the throng of every, anybody and everybody to come through the building. Now, if one were to say, and the core, by the way, has to exist in the center of the building because that's where the structure uh, holds up this 64-story tower. To skirt around the core to create a public way to go all the way through the building um, would get in the way of some necessary spaces such as a truck dock or elevators for the trucks to go down. The um, MTA and, and uh, subway access stairs and escalators that we need as we, more than anything really, for the public good in the building. A certain amount of retail which the city planning uh, uh, guidelines uh, require and suggest to enliven uh, the day and nighttime, you know, so that it's not an alleyway, but it's a wonderful, lovely part of town. So with so many elements of use that are good for everybody, competing for space in this only 43 thousand square foot block. It's a very small block as Manhattan blocks go, right. not 200 by 800, 200 by 600, but 200 by 200 rough odd. Um, there is just no room to drive a public way right through the site. Mr. Holliday, do you want to add something? No, I, I think the size of the site. I mean, I was just to condense that. You know, it's, it's a much smaller site than what you find on 6th and 7th Avenue where you have the requirements for the, for the through block because it's such a large expanse, 200 by 200. It's already a very, you know, tight block, if you will. And we do have entrances on both sides, even though it's not through block. Uh, the, let's talk about the, uh, the daylight evaluation score here, because this is something that's come up repeatedly from the community board, and I think that uh, city planning should address it. There's, there's, a, there's a divergence here between what the Midtown standard is and what this building achieves. Um, can you address the differential uh, and what findings city planning made that, that, that should draw us to the conclusion that this building is, uh, has a fair if, uh, and, and not overwhelming impact on, uh, on light 
and air here. Sure. Um, so give a little bit of background. Midtown has special height and setback regulations. They're very complicated. They're very abstract. No one really understands them. Um, Except but for Frank. <laughs> I, I was counting on you to understand Oop. them. Um, I didn't either. Um, uh, they were developed to be general, and as a, actually, as Jamie was talking about, Midtown generally has long rectangular blocks. The blocks of Vanderbilt are very different. Four streets are kind of, they're a unique condition in Midtown, and the rules um, historically have never really worked for, block, for these blocks. Um, in 2013, we proposed a series of changes to those height and setback controls to actually allow for development to occur on these blocks in a um, more logical way. Um, so the propo so uh, after that was withdrawn, and because this is a fully discretionary action, we didn't include any modifications to those regulations. Um, what uh, the general view, what their general intent is to ensure access to light and air from the sidewalk, from the pedestrian on the sidewalk. Um, the uh, intent or as part of the special permits findings, it includes that the building must effectively meet the spirit of those. Um, and I think the intent of this building has tapering um, does that, right? It's kind of the intent of these is to actually have a tower that tapers. Um, one of the thing, the other thing I would, I would note um, is a lot of the things that the building is trying to do to actually be in its context are exactly the things that are making its score low. Uh, particularly on its Vanderbilt, or on its 42nd and Madison Street frontage, where the street walls are higher, just around in the context. Um, Midtown doesn't contemplate street walls like that, again, because it's just gen generic kind of setback controls. So here is a building that's actually trying to meet that context by having higher street walls on those frontages and is getting penalized for doing that, right? So again, as part of the findings, the commission and the council too has to look at the building, its relation to its context, and then determine whether those waivers are appropriate. Thank you. And let's go from there to uh, the last few questions that I have. Um, environmental standards, another subject that has come up over time. Uh, you know, I think we are all of the view that this, the environmental standards for this building should be the highest in the city. You all have taken some rather significant steps uh, to, uh, to ensure that you have a very uh, sustainable building. Uh, but if you can give us a sense as to uh, what steps you have taken, um, where you are, uh, and uh, just give us a give us a flavor as to, mm -hmm. you know, where you are in the lead standard, why why you got where you are, or where you couldn't get, or why you couldn't get to other places. You know, if I might suggest, on a, a subsequent panel, we have our uh, head of sustainability for SL Green coming up with. I believe Lead and some other folks are here okay, to hold the question. Discuss that it. Is so, That's the know, appropriate. Group I don't want to, to preempt that it. over with. Uh, let's talk about the the design of the base for a moment, because um, in the presentation uh, you had noted that it was uh, done in a way that would allow for much more appreciation of Grand Central, um, and I think that that is that is um, an objective fact based on how you have done it. Uh, but I guess the there were questions that were raised at the community board level about the design and how it interacts there, and they, um, you know, asked you to consider various changes or component parts here that uh, could be addressed. And I wanted to see if you uh, thought about that at all and and how you landed where you did. If you can go to the view from the viaduct, um, it, it's true that our strategy and our our belief and design is. Uh, as we all know, somewhat subjective set of, of discussions. Um, but objectively speaking, yes, the view from 42nd and Madison towards Grand Central Terminal uh, is substantially more revealing of the landmark building that, that I think we're, we're all talking about. In other words, the terminal itself, uh, because there is a legal relationship of this harmonious tone that has to be struck between this new proposed building and the terminal in order for it to be successful in in the transfer of of, uh, of air rights. So um, yes, there is a greater uh, view. Our feeling, this is again a, an interpretation of a design team, a design group, and and its collaborators and the client as well, is that the complementary relationship, not the rep repetition or the or the mimicking of uh, a kind of classical architecture of the terminal, 
characterized by solid materials, deep squared or rectangular windows, and classical ornament, that the, rather than repeating or even um, more literally recalling that in a modern building, that a modern architectural expression, which you see, I believe you'd see, say so on the screen, um, of a more transparent nature would be appropriate. Now, the cha changes were made uh, as a result of a workshop process between uh, the commission, rather the uh, uh, community group and uh, client and architects. And that manifested, the changes manifested themselves within um, the entry to the building, which is just sort of beyond the roadway in the center of the facade facing Vanderbilt, where a series of delicate screens of bronze detailing have been added to recall some of the decorative motifs that are across the way in the big arched windows of Grand Central Terminal. So yes, these are subtleties. One sees them, though, at the ground, um, which is, I think, where view matters most. It's where pedestrians will experience life. And, uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier in presenting, uh, and this wasn't a result of the change, but maybe enhanced as a result of our, our discussions with the community board, that these spandrels of terracotta will be um, taken all the way up through the building. So as much as possible where we're detailing and crafting the base of the building, uh, a genuine good faith effort has been made to try to um, you know, make something that's harmonious with the terminal. I think another issue that has less to do with architecture, more with use, that the community board felt very strongly about how the public spaces would be used inside this building, how public transit users would come through their particular route, uh, and whether, as uh, Mr. Schiffer said, whether the space inside would be one of uh, passageway or of rest. And all of those complex discussions, I think we followed the kind of general uh, feeling and, and wisdom of those with whom we're collaborating. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, that those are all the questions that I have. So I will uh, defer for the moment to our next panels, but I will note we look forward to our ongoing conversations with the applicant of one Vanderbilt on ways to maximize the opportunities for the public, ensure that we have the design straight, uh, and, um, and, and make sure that we hit the right balance here. So we thank you for your testimony and city planning. Obviously, this is a, uh, uh, you know, in my view, a much more thoughtful approach uh, to starting with our East Midtown rezoning process. So we thank you for your openness to that, and we've enjoyed working with you. Thank you. Thank you. One last question, as long as you're here. Uh, you heard the stairwell amendment before. I was just curious, the elevator, the fire safe elevators, is that something you're familiar with, Mr. Holiday, and or have you dealt with in the architectural field this idea of having elevators that are okay to exit in during a fire, God forbid? Uh, in our, so, uh, the KBF practice is a worldwide practice that, among other things, focuses on the super tall building. And it's an idea which is in, it's being developed now around the world in our experience rather than f implemented or it, it's not in built structures. Um, and so in the case of this building, we're adding a third stair. There, in other words, there are extra security measures post 9-11 mm -hmm. that are part of this uh, proposal and part of this plan. Uh, not that the elevator is not a good idea. It's right. a good idea. But this this proposal is not relying on that, obviously. Will people be advised that this building, God forbid, something happens not to use the elevators or to use the elevators? In this case, not to use the elevators. Okay. All right. Just curious. All right. Well, thank you all very much. We thank you for your patience. Um, so he, from here, we're, we're going to call up the MTA just briefly, if we could keep it as short as possible, um, to sort of fill in the gaps here. And then we are going to switch to um, inviting people up in panels uh, against and in favor of the project. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to limit people to, a pro to two minutes each. So if you're with a number of people together on the same topic, maybe you can coordinate your remarks to make sure you hit all your points. 
Uh, that doesn't mean there won't be questions possibly for you afterwards. So I'd like to call up for the MTA Robert Paley, David Haas, and Frederica Cuenca. Close? No, I didn't do that well, but I did. Okay. Uh, you grimaced, I thought. Do, do you have a, a formal presentation you're going to make? Okay. All right. If I could ask you to please limit that uh, as much as possible. It's, it's been a long day for everybody so far, and I appreciate everyone's patience. As Councilman Gorodnik mentioned, this is an important issue for all the New Yorkers. It's been a long time coming, and there were some questions we just needed to have addressed, and he wanted to bring up. So. So we appreciate your patience. But if you can be as brief as possible, and we'll have a couple of questions, I'm sure, for you as well. Shh, quiet in the room, and make sure the mic is on and speak loudly. Okay, all right. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Frederica Cuenca from the MTA, uh, Director of Strategic Initiatives. Um, over the past 30 years, the MTA has transformed its massive system. We've invested in trains, tracks, power, and stations. We've renovated Grand Central, making it a wonderful public space and a well-functioning transportation hub. As a result of these successful investments, people have returned to the system. The subway, on the subway, ridership is levels that have not been seen since the late 1940s. And for the first time in a generation, the MTA system is expanding. The seven train extension will connect to a rapidly developing new neighborhood on the far west side of Manhattan to the rest of the city. The first segment of 2nd Avenue subway will ease congestion on the Lexington Avenue line and at Grand Central. East Side access will bring Long Island Railroad riders directly to a new terminal at Grand Central, reducing their travel times by up to 40 minutes a day. The Vanderbilt Corridor rezoning proposal complements and builds on this massive public investment already underway. It will put density where it belongs, next to some of the best transit in the country. With MTA's investments, this area's access to public transit will be even better. The MTA has shared its strategic plan for Grand Central Subway Station. This plan includes a number of discrete improvement projects that would greatly improve the capacity of the station and the experience for the people who use it. The One Vanderbilt Project and the Quarter Rezoning advances that plan significantly, providing substantial improvements to the Lexington Avenue part of the station. Then, as each block develops, there is an opportunity for similar significant additional investment in the transit network to advance the MTA's plan. In addition, the Vanderbilt proposal creates and capitalizes on the opportunity that comes from new construction to make connections that would be impossible or too expensive to tackle with existing buildings in place. The connection for Eastside access to 42nd Street and the direct connection to the shuttle passageway up to the street are prime examples of this opportunities. In sum, SL Green has proposed an integrated package of both on-site and off-site improvements that would provide important benefits to the public and MTA riders. Last fall, the MTA put forward a proposal for its next five-year capital program, covering the years 2015 to 19. Ongoing investment in the reliability and resiliency of our existing infrastructure will make it possible to carry more people as the city grows. This region is engaged in a dialogue about the importance of these investments and how we are going to close the funding gap. Private investment in transit infrastructure has an important role to play in meeting this region's needs and in fueling continued economic growth. The MTA welcomes land use redevelopment proposals like the Vanderbilt Corridor that include ongoing sources of revenue for transit investment. Now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Robert Payne. Thank you. Just make sure everyone states their name when they start their speech. Great. Yep. My name is Robert Paley. I'm Director of Transit-Oriented Development at MTA. And I'm speaking in support of the proposed Vanderbilt corridor text and mapping changes as it relates to the disposition of our former headquarters on Madison Avenue. As you know, the MTA has been encouraged to maximize the real estate assets that we own for public benefit. The Madison Avenue headquarters, located on half of the block between 44th and 45th Streets, is one of MTA's most promising sites for disposition. Proceeds from the disposition will be used to support MTA's capital program. We initially offered the site prior to the Vanderbilt Corridor proposal and issued an addendum to the RFP late last year to reflect the proposed rezoning and the range of opportunities offered by the zoning to increase base FAR above the current as of right. The potential to increase zoning floor area through this district supports MTA's goals to maximize value. At the same time, our redevelopment would improve pedestrian connections. 
The RFP requires a direct connection be constructed through the new building on Madison Avenue to the Long Island Railroad concourse being constructed below Vanderbilt Avenue. The RFP also requires that the existing connection from the building to Grand Central be maintained. Responses are being evaluated with the assistance of Cushman and Wakefield, which is also helping to refine and clarify financial and technical aspects of the proposals. In conformance with the proposed zoning, any selected development proposal will be subject to public review as part of its own EULER. Our goal is to narrow the field within the next few months. We would like to move quickly as the Madison Avenue buildings, other than retail, are substantially vacant with MTA's headquarters' recent downtown relocation. In sum, this proposal helps MTA maximize public benefit from disposition of its former headquarters, and we're supportive of the city's initiative to undertake this zoning change. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is David Hazy. I'm director of station planning for uh, the Transit Authority. Um, I want to, uh, SL Green has already described uh, most of the improvements that they would undertake uh, as part of their project. I want to hit three other points. One was the circulation impacts of their improvements. The other was, um, the second is for uh, uh, addition, um, additional uh, circulation issues that need remedy in the uh, uh, farther term. And then finally, the circulation impacts of those uh, further improvements. This would answer some of the questions you had, Chairman, uh, earlier this morning. Um, the proposed one Vanderbilt project will generate 1,800 additional moves during the peak hour in the Grand Central subway station. However, this would be 3% of the total moves that are projected in 2020 in, uh, in Grand Central subway. Um, the improvements that SL Green would do by themselves will add significant uh, capacity improvements. Um, 20 8% to the downtown Lexington platform, 8% to the uptown Lexington platform, and 19% uh, uh, more capacity from the mezzanine up to the street. So this is why New York City Transit is so very interested in the one Vanderbilt proposal itself. It will add 3% more riders, but add significantly more capacity and will remedy current con uh, congestion we have right now. Getting on into the future, um, Beyond the improvements that SL Green would build, there is still need for additional work, uh, particularly on the flushing platform. Um, New York City Transit has, has been studying Grand Central for years now, has figured out what we think we know what needs to happen and how to do it. The improvements are buildable. Uh, we just need uh, someone to build them for us, um, given our capital program. Uh, finally, in the long term, uh, 2033 projections uh, have, uh, based on worst case reasonable development scenarios of East Midtown, have up to 30% more riders in Grand Central uh, subway station. Um, however, the improvements that we have designed uh, would add uh, up to 45% more capacity at key choke points. And that's really the key here. We need to go beyond uh, remedying our current congestion and get ahead of the game, and that's what we believe we have the plan to do. We just need the uh, money and the uh, improvements to do that. Um, one final point. Grand Central is at the intersection of two of our busiest lines, uh, the Lexington uh, North-South line and the Flushing East-West line. Uh, by improving station flow at Grand Central subway station, we will improve the um, reliability uh, and, and frequency of both the uh, Lexington uh, Expresses and the Flushing, which will in turn benefit far more riders than even those using Grand Central, but on the entire uh, Lex and Flushing corridors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll start with Councilmember Garodnik. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, can you just review for us some of the, the key stats about the improvements of uh, that the MTA will see or that riders would see if the, uh, if the improvements from the SL Green 1 Vanderbilt proposal were implemented. They had cited one additional train per peak hour. Give us some, if you could, from the MTA's perspective, it's, we want to hear it from you all, as to what the benefits will will be for uh, for a commuter through Grand Central, either as a um, Metro North uh, or a future East Side access, or just you know people like me, a four, five, six, um, and subway and shuttle rider. What will we be experiencing from this? Um, 
In our more detailed uh, presentations, we have a uh, plans of the existing mezzanine, Lexington mezzanine and Lexington platforms. And what we've done is we've circled uh, the basically stairways and escalators that are over congested or uh, at risk of being over congested, which results in basically many, many, many red circles. Right now, the platform stairs on the Lexington platforms, um, probably over half of them, well, on the, on the downtown platform, most of them are operating at LOS uh, D or E during the peak hour. Uh, and that's a, uh, by LOS level of service, uh, that means that these stairs are, are severely congested. And, and so is that on a scale of A to F? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yep, that's uh, downtown. Downtown Lexington platform during the yep. morning rush. Uh, F is complete failure. Um, e is you're severely backed up. Uh, D is where you are moving up the stair uh, in a crowded condition, not at the uh, pace you would normally walk uh, in an uncongested uh, condition. The SL, the one Vanderbilt improvements by adding three more stairs and relocating and widening another stair, I'm sorry, adding two more stairs uh, and uh, relocating and widening uh, another plat Lexington uh, downtown platform stair will uh, result in the immediate uh, improvement of um, level of service on these stairs uh, with nobody operating worse than LOSD in the short term. Um, there will be some more growth, um, but our, our studies have shown that the Lexington platform stairs, both up and downtown, there will be basically one stair operating, I think, at an LOSE on the uptown platform in the evening, and everything else, all other stairs would be at LOSD or better. Um, this is far better than what we have right now. The um, LOS for the uptown Lexington during the, the rush is what you said for the downtown? It was uh, D or the e. uptown platform during the morning rush is, uh, is operating okay. It's during the evening rush, basically when Wall Street comes back uptown to go to Westchester um, and Queens, um, that there's uh, uh, the greatest impact on the uptown platform. Um, and we are current, uh, as the one Vanderbilt will add one more stair to the uptown platform at the far north end. Um, and uh, the, I think only one stair would be operating at LOS, uh, uh, a very, very low LOSE. Okay. So there's, there's a vast improvement in the platforms. Plus what uh, uh, S.L. Green mentioned, which is really, really important, which is the reconfiguration of all the stairs to create more area at platform level to allow people to get to better distribute themselves and get on and off faster. Do you agree with the assessment that will allow one more train to come through per hour at peak time? That came from us, yes. Okay. Is, so, um, uh, and during the non-peak times, it would, just be, it would just be standard. It's just a... It's really relevant at the peak at the peak hours because that's where you're at your capacity. That's the greatest concentration. Okay, when you when you noted in your testimony that improvements um, that you had designed would result in 45 percent more capacity at key choke points, that's uh, improvements that are separate and apart from what we're talking about here today. That was, uh, if all of that includes the current work that the Transit Authority is doing, the, the Ken Cole stair, that would include the one Vanderbilt improvements, and that would improve, include all the improvements that we have uh, identified. Um, and this would be long, longer term. I see. So all improvements that you've identified that are, are not yet funded and we don't right. yet have a plan for. But I do want to stress that the one Vanderbilt improvements cover uh, all of the functional improvements we have uh, uh, figured out for the Lexington platforms and almost everything for the mezzanine up to street. That's good. So That's which brings good. me to my last question, which is, can we count on the MTA to help us think through your particular needs so that we can consider ways to synchronize rezoning proposals, both current and future, to be able to accommodate uh, the, the significant needs that you have? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, so let me just ask a couple of quick questions then. Um, so uh, as we move forward, uh, whatever the next project uh, that is, comes down the pike and that's likely to be the MTA headquarters maybe on Madison Avenue, which I know is an RFP out, um, what types of transit improvements do you envision would be the ideal 
for these projects? Like, what, we, what's the most important thing that these projects can focus on to further enhance the transportation options? Um, there is some, a little bit more functional improvements we want to do on the Lexington mezzanine that was not touched by uh, either our, our current scope or one Vanderbilt scope. And then the, then the, the next two big issues are, are the flushing platform. There's four ways on and off the flushing platform. We have plans to improve all four of those uh, ways off. Uh, there is also, if, if there's still <laughs> uh, FAR bonus money available, we will be completely restructuring the 42nd Street shuttle. Um, and it will need work uh, mostly at the Times Square end, but also at the Grand, uh, Grand Central Arc. There's no shortage of proposed work to be done in the Grand Central uh, subway station. How, how closely have you worked with SL Green on the design of, uh, of the improvements? I mean, these improvements all come from the MTA, or did their designers come up with ideas that you otherwise wouldn't have done? The offsite, the stuff inside the subway, was um, stuff that we had been um, coincidentally uh, determining ourselves uh, ahead of uh, East Midtown and Vanderbilt Core and one Vanderbilt. But, but was there a discussion? Obviously, you were part of that planning and discussion, or were you, was MTA not part of that discussion exactly of what the improvements would look like in the end? You mean which improvements? What are they going to do? Well, I'm talking about the ones that SL Green's paying for as far as the pillars and, and staircases mm -hmm. and posts. Were those all, did those come from, the, from your guys' drawing boards or from SL Green's? No, that was all uh, our work. Just with, the, did they add any stylistic changes? Did they add anything like that? Or that's just their money, your project? Uh, they gave us very nice renderings that we didn't have. Right. Um, uh, in terms of functionality, inside the subway station, uh, it was really uh, all coming from us. Um, I, I can't think of anything. Onsite, of course, was much more collaborative. Mm -hmm. uh, we had ideas about how to best serve passenger flows uh, and, uh, and Grand Central waiting area, mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that was probably subject to much more design discussion than the, offs, than the stuff inside the subway. Okay, and um, if we never got to this point, um, if we never got to, you know, we were where we were after we d didn't take up the uh, Midtown East last time, and Essel Green went ahead with their projects, which they were going to do, and didn't come up with the $210 million, um, what would have happened as far as this site? Um, well, I guess one is if they, if they, I think it would be a shame for this site uh, not to connect into transit the way it is. It's a and any site that's, that's adjacent to a transit network has an opportunity to contribute to making the circulation better. So I think that would be a tremendously um, poor lost opportunity. Um, in terms of the integration into the, of the station and subway improvements, you know, look, our capital program, it's a constrained uh, operation, so we're mm -hmm. constantly having to juggle as to, you know, what investments to make when. Um, so these are very, very important projects, um, but we, we think that this kind of private uh, investment um, where there can be this um, virtuous cycle of economic activity and investment into the transit infrastructure is a great uh, model to, um, to do in places like East Midtown and other um, important transportation Okay. And, and if they didn't come up, I mean, I mean, if they built as of right, different type of building, a little different, maybe, um, would NTA have come up with money to make certain improvements, if not all these improvements? So um, I guess as the model for um, last, the last capital program, we put in the money for the, um, the Ken Cole stairs. It was about $25 million out of our capital program. So I don't want to say that we would never do these projects. We did include them into our capital program, but we were, are looking at, we were knowing that this was um, on the horizon. So it's very difficult to us, for us to say, yes, we would absolutely do that project. These are system improvement projects. The majority of our capital program is spent on state of good repair, renewal of our existing assets. That's the most important um, for us. Okay. All right. Dan, any other questions? Well, thank you very much, and we appreciate your patience as well. All right, now we're going to move on, as I mentioned, to panels in favor, in opposition first, and then in favor of the project uh, of people 
Um, we are going to have to limit people to a clock of two minutes, Sergeant at Arms. Um, so what I'm going to do is call up a panel on opposition first. We're going to bring people up, four people at a time. So we had to separate some of the opposition. We took the list as we got it. So I'd like to call up the following people. It is Law Gisico, Ellen Imbinbo, John West, and Wally Rubio. Oh, we lost. All right. Okay. How many people are here now? So we have three? Three here or four? Three. I'm confused. There are three. All right. Okay. So, I, again, I apologize that we're going to have to limit it to two minutes, but you all look like you've done this before. And uh, so whenever you're ready, uh, you could, yes, question? Before you start, go ahead, shoot. Hello, my yeah. name is Ellen Mbimbo, and I am the uh, Vice Chair of Land Use and Waterfront of Community Board 6, and I am um, uh, also a member of the Multiboard Task Force. I'm delivering this testimony on behalf of Terry O'Neill, who's the Chair of Land Use Committee. Um, he says, most news accounts, many politicians and those in the business world often applaud the public improvements to be completed by S.L. Green for constructing one Vanderbilt, and it is an impressive package of improvements. I still believe, however, that there is one important aspect of the project that is missing, and that is a publicly, ac publicly accessible lobby. While Burr President Brewer was able to achieve some concessions in this area through the addition of an entrance from the transit hall to the lobby, much more needs to be done. This building is receiving 532,750 square feet of bonus floor area. This is unprecedented in East Midtown. At the very least, at this prominent location near a major transit hub, an open public lobby should be provided. Once to do, one needs more to do more than walk in, in observe, and walk out of the developer, um, uh, walk out if the developer is rewarded with a generous public realm improvement bonus of 41% of the building's total floor area. Put another way, the generous public realm improvement bonus is permitting the developer to nearly double the allowable floor area. A member of the public deserves to pass through this state-of-the-art lobby as one moves to and from Grand Central, the subway system, and east side access. One should be able to pass through as well while moving from Vanderbilt to Madison Avenue. The developer at one, Madis at one Vanderbilt has cited security current concerns with open public access. This is understandable. The developer needs to respond to the concerns of prospective tenants. However, with innovative designs, and the will to do so in open accessible lobby is very achievable while maintaining high security for tenants. For example, at World Four, Four World Trade Center State of the Art Tower, recently completed in Lower Manhattan, the goal of inviting you could finish. The public just take, well, just keep keep reading. Finish okay. it. I you got started. I know you started talking, and the clock started right away. Right. Okay. So, the goal of inviting the public in while remain my maintaining high security for tenants is gracefully uh, gracefully achieved. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, were I able to, I would have, on my own behalf, just added um, another point. More discussion is needed about the problems to be faced regarding public circulation above ground. Um, there's been a great deal of discussion, a requirement to widen Madison Avenue. There remains the issue of handling the flow of pedestrian traffic on Madison, not to mention the already crowded sidewalks of Lexington Avenue. With added numbers of pedestrians due to east side access, one Vanderbilt and other buildings that may be constructed along the corridor, it is essential to study public space needs in a comprehensive way. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen? Okay. The button? Okay. My name is Wally Rubin. I'm speaking here today for Vicki Barbera, who's the chair of Community Board 5. We want to thank Chair Weprin and the committee for giving us this opportunity. We especially want to thank our council member, Dan Gorodnik, for always keeping his door as well as his mind and heart open to us and our concerns. 
We come here today to re-emphasize our concerns about the Vanderbilt Corridor. We appreciate that on 42nd Street, with the right considerations pertaining to daylight and sustainability, along with the public improvements at and below grade, a 30 FAR building makes sense. We have seen how the Bank of America building works well on 42nd Street adjacent to Bryan Park. However, we cannot see any way that a series of 30 FAR buildings north of one Vanderbilt adjacent to no wide streets and no vast expanse of greenery will be acceptable public policy. Such a conglomeration of towers, no matter what the public amenities, cannot help but create a deadening canyon effect up Madison that we will regret forevermore. The City Planning Commission counters that each of these proposed projects will be required to go through a full public review process. But as sure as we know that the MTA is short half of its public budget to the tune of $15 billion and is unable to pay for desperately needed capital projects, we all know that the pressure to use private developers to pay for long overdue improvements will only grow and ultimately overshadow pun intended, the public's right to a decent amount of light and air. We have no doubt that given the allowance to ask for 30 FAR, every developer in the corridor will ask for the full floor air ratio, and the pressure to approve these oversized towers will prove overwhelming. The ULOC before you today is government's only opportunity to decide what is right and in the public interest for the corridor as a whole, and we are convinced that a string of of these greatest, tallest towers is not the correct, correct answer. Can I Just finish up quickly if you can. It so happens that there's already a scheme put forth by John West and others to create a metric for the amount of FAR that would be allowable. Councilmember Grodnick spoke to it before. It's simple and smart. It would create a series of four or five questions regarding each site, such as whether the site fronts a wide street or avenue and whether it is above a transit hub. If the answer is yes to a particular question, a certain added level of density would be allowable. If the answer is yes to all the questions, as it is at one Vanderbilt, then and only then a grand total of 30 FAR would be permitted. We think this metric makes sense and is good public policy, and we ask the council to seriously consider it. Thank you. Thank you. John, sir. I'm John West. I'm a member of Community Board 6 and the Multi-Board Task Force. I'm also a member of the City Club. I believe that what I'm about to say is consistent with their concerns. If the City Council is going to approve the proposed zoning for the Vanderbilt Corridor and the special permits for one Vanderbilt, it should first make two changes. These changes would modify the expectation that all sites within the corridor can achieve 30 FAR and would grant one Vanderbilt only the FAR it has really earned. First, not all of the sites within the Vanderbilt Corridor are equal. Some are better positioned to accommodate greater density than others. Of the five blocks, the one to be occupied by one Vanderbilt enjoys the most density-justifying characteristics. It faces on two wide streets. It overlooks the air park above Grand Central. It is adjacent to and will connect to a subway station. And it is adjacent to and will connect to the pedestrian circulation system of Terminal City. The proposed zoning should be modified to make explicit that sites that enjoy fewer of these density justifying characteristics should be limited to proportionally less maximum FAR. Second, one Vanderbilt should only be granted bonus floor area for density ameliorating amenities that truly improve the public realm, not for investments that are of little or no real benefit to the community or which should rightly be provided by others. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the uh, next four examples and go to the conclusion, which is a detailed analysis is attached. It's just been handed in. Um, by this calculus, one Vanderbilt would earn approximately six FAR less. This would either leave the building a bit smaller at 24 FAR or require it to provide additional improvements to the public realm. Either alternative would be in the public's interest. Thank you. Thank you, good timing. I'd like to call on the uh, open door, big heart and sharp mind, Dan Garodnik. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. West, you heard the testimony from city planning in response to my 
questions about the site criteria, that there really is no distinction in their view between adjacency to a subway entrance and adjacency to Grand Central proper because you can get wherever you need to go through Grand Central proper. W what is your response to that? I think it's useful to make a distinction between the terminal city pedestrian circulation system, uh, which serves Grand Central, and the subway stations in the area. Uh, the subway stations are all along 42nd Street. Uh, buildings that are close to those subway stations have a more intimate relationship with them than do buildings a couple of blocks to the north that have to get there through the terminal city circulation system. I think it's a distinction worth making. Uh, and uh, Ms. Uh, Mbimbo, thank you for your testimony, and uh, I'm going to stick with the formalities here. Um, but I, I hope you will uh, bring back to uh, to the chair, the land use chair, Terry O'Neill, the testimony of um, one Vanderbilt on the subject of the limitations in the lobby. I, you know, I share his interest in seeing the maximum freedom for the public to be able to enjoy the lobby. I also do recognize that there are obvious constraints about a building that needs to be built and needs to have a core and needs to have security measures to get people in and out safely. So I, I welcome the further conversation with you guys on that subject if there are further thoughts, but I thought that that was, um, that was relevant. And a uh, big picture, I agree with you about the metrics. Uh, so I think that we should see how to work that into this proposal either um, as um, the findings that need to be met or explicitly as, you know, you get FAR for these following things. So we're going to continue that conversation as we go forward. So thank you. And thank you all, by the way, for being great guides to me throughout this whole process, both in the last time around and also to this one, to the multi-board task force and to boards five and six. I thank you. Well, thank you very much. Okay, we're now going to call up a panel in support of this project. Uh, Jay Black, Peter Sciala, uh, Russell, is it Unger? And Colin Wright. We have all four of those people here. Should we add Carolyn? Yeah. Um, is Carolyn Harris here too? Um, come, why don't you come up also for this panel? I, I know, um, and we're going to stop it there. Um, okay. So, oh no, there's three of you only here now. Okay, good. So we're going to switch Carolyn Harris into the fourth seat then. But you guys, I don't know how coordinated you are, but okay. Everyone's good? Oh, there are. Okay, we need an extra chair then. You said Colin Wright, I'm Tom Wright. I did say Colin Wright. Is it, so it's not Tom Wright? Uh, wait, wait, what is it? From, From the New York League of Conservation Voters. No, okay. Sorry. Okay, have a seat. Um, gentlemen, why don't you go first since I called you first. Um, and then same, the same two minutes if you can li be limited to. Thank you. Great, good afternoon. My name is Jay Black. I'm Director of Sustainability for SL Green Realty Corp. And sustainability is a critical tool for our business. And as part of our market-leading uh, program between 2010 and 2014, we've completed more than $35 million in energy efficiency projects to save more than $10 million annually through various measures while looking ahead to new cutting-edge technologies including cogeneration, solar, fuel cells, and others. We support our tenants' sustainability programs by providing key education about our building initiatives while receiving certifications, including the Energy Star label, at 24 of our buildings. We've also achieved four LEED certifications, including three gold level designations, while positioning three more buildings to achieve this designation in 2015. This success has led to Newsweek to name SL Green amongst its 2014 America's Greenest Companies, and I'm also proud to announce that the US EPA has just announced that SL Green is a 2015 Energy Star Partner of the Year. You can learn more about our program, which I've provided today through our sustainability report, and our current portfolio-wide effort has set a new environmental standard for New York City, culminating with one Vanderbilt. This is our most ambitious program to date. 
and we are going to be the first in New York City to pursue LEED's latest and most rigorous version 4. Even though this program is not scheduled to take effect until 2016, we've, desi we've designed the project to achieve a gold level designation under a version that is 15 to 20 percent more stringent than the current. One Vanderbilt will achieve one of the lowest carbon footprints any any anywhere through Midtown Manhattan's unparalleled density, access to amenities, walkability, and mass transit systems. Low E glazing, high efficiency, high efficiency mechanical systems, LED lighting and cogeneration come together to achieve the greatest efficiency while restroom fixtures reduce building water consumption by 50 percent. We'll install a 60,000 gallon tank to capture rainwater for reuse while structural steel will have recycled content to reduce reliance on raw materials. <coughs> Our program is focused on environmentalism at all levels, but we're not going to stop there because One Vanderbilt takes this program one more step to go beyond the best green technology to elevate human sustainability. And to complement our LEED certification, we're pursuing a new designation that focuses on health, well-being, and comfort called the wellness certification. I'll be 10 more seconds. As the largest office tower to pursue this new certification in the country, this program addresses air, uh, pure air and water standards, light quality, fit fitness, and tenant comfort. And we're confident that between both our wellness certification and high-ranking LEED certification, this will establish a new precedent for New York. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, you guys can fight it out. Yeah. Yes. Uh, as, as, a, uh, as a continuation of that, I'm uh, Peter Schella. I'm the co-founder of the International Well Building Institute. Um, and so as, as Jay mentioned, that the, uh, the tower is not only pursuing LEED certification, but well certification as well. Uh, we in, uh, embarked on this journey about seven years ago and had partnered with the U.S. Green Building Council, so the same administration that offers LEED certification uh, is now the certifying body for well certification. This focuses on occupant health. Environmental health, one half of the sustainability equation, uh, but we spend 92 percent of our time indoors, and we thought it was uh, useful, obviously, to focus on what buildings were doing to the people inside. Uh, so SL Green, as a thought leader and pioneer, has, uh, is striving to achieve well certification. The program was rolled out last year uh, and is uh, receiving remarkable adop uh, adoption across the, across the country. Um, a well certified space, it's important to note this, is actually audited and measured at the end of the process. So if a well certification seal goes on a building, that means the building is actually performing, not just followed protocols, but performing in the areas of purified air, purified water, lighting that's more conducive to the body's health, uh, nutrition, active design, fitness, and so on and so forth. So with a, with a seal on the door, uh, we feel very confident that the building is actually healthy for the people inside and not just for the environment. All right, well, good. Are we the afternoon? Yeah, afternoon at Chair Weprin and Councilmember Grodnick. My name is Russell Unger. I'm the Executive Director of Urban Green Council. We're the New York City affiliate of the U.S. Green Building Council, which developed and maintains the LEED Green Building Rating System. I'm here to testify concerning the differences between LEED's latest version, LEED V4, and its previous version, LEED 2009. I'm providing this information just as context, and we're expressly not taking a position on the uh, permit application before you today. LEED's a continuously evolving uh, standard. It becomes more stringent with each addition. Designing a building under LEED v4 is much more challenging than designing one under the previous versions of LEED. The energy bar for LEED v4 for a core and shell building in New York City is 14 percent higher than the energy bar under the previous version of LEED. And this is because they use different baselines for the energy code they compare against. The energy bar for Levy 4 is the same energy code we now have required in New York City as of this year. An office building that beats uh, today's code by 14 percent would be about 30 percent more energy efficient than one built last year to meet code. Given the significant differences in the energy baseline, a gold LEED V4 building uh, would probably achieve platinum under the previous version of LEED, LEED 2009. Developers still have the option of using this previous older version of LEED, and any developer that opts to use LEED 4, LEED 4 is uh, voluntarily choosing a higher bar for themselves. No office building has been yet built in New York City to LEED V4. The first to do so will hopefully make LEED V4 the new standard for office buildings in New York. Thank you. Okay. Now I'd like to call Ms. Harris. I apologize for keeping you waiting uh, from the Roosevelt Hotel, right? Okay. Pass the mic over so we can. Okay. 
All right. Ms. Harris. Good morning, Chairman Weprin, Councilman Gorodnik, uh, and the staff of the committee. Thank you so much for having me scoot into this panel. I'm Caroline Harris of Goldman Harris LLC. I represent the Roosevelt Hotel, a uh, 1,015-room full-service unionized hotel located at 45 East 45th Street. The hotel supports the Grand Central Public Realm improvements and landmark transfer special permits that allow an FAR of 30, especially if, at the outset, all of the sites in the corridor uh, would be able to meet the criteria to grant it and that they are fairly applied. However, it is against the requirement that any development containing a transient hotel be allowed only by special permit. We appreciate that the City Planning Commission eliminated the requirement of a special permit for the enlargement of an existing hotel, but the Commission did not go far enough. It should have eliminated the special permit requirement altogether for the Vanderbilt Corridor. There is no evidence or land use rationale to support the need for a hotel special permit in the corridor. With respect to the 2013 Midtown zoning proposal, stakeholders raised concerns regarding the appropriateness of limited service hotels in that broad district. But that testimony is not relevant to the Vanderbilt corridor. There is no evidence in city planning's report or the FEIS that a Vanderbilt corridor is a target for newly developed hotels, limited or full service. As a practical matter, however, the Roosevelt Hotel is the only existing hotel site in the city that would need a special permit to continue its 91-year-old business in a brand new, perhaps larger building. This is like negative spot zoning. It is not part of a comprehensive plan relating to hotels as required by the general city law or the Supreme Court. It is unfair to the Roosevelt Hotel. The fact that some desire such a special permit throughout Midtown or throughout the city does not constitute a comprehensive plan or level the playing field for the, host, the Roosevelt Hotel. To avoid this le legal problem, uh, all legislation regarding hotels in Midtown should be deferred and addressed comprehensively, or uh, only full-service hotels should be allowed in the Vanderbilt corridor on an as-of-right basis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We weren't sure how to squeeze you in as for or against. Uh, I'm for, but yeah, I'm no, just well, so that's why we had a little confusion. Um, Mr. Garodnik, we'll start with you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to start with Mr. Unger, who taught me just about everything I uh, ever knew about environmental uh, sustainability in New York City. The question for you, Mr. Unger, is one, if uh, the one Vanderbilt building had decided to operate under the 2009 lead rules, Am I to understand you to say that it would have been a LEED Platinum building? There's no guarantees, but given that LEED, uh, the newer version of LEED is that much more challenging, it seems pretty likely. And is there, knowing what you know about the building, and I don't want to put you on the spot here because that was not your testimony, uh, but I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Do you think that there are more things that one Vanderbilt could have done here to have achieved a gold, I'm sorry, a, a platinum standard under lead version four? And if so, what, what, are, what do you think that might have been? Or could be still, we're still obviously considering this. I mean, there's any building can do whatever it wants. It's a question of how much it costs and what you're gonna get for it. And they made, a, they made an assessment based on what they can invest in the building, what they could get return environmentally, and what the market would bear. So it's a, it's a too complex, uh, complex a question for me to give you yes. Okay, well, we're going to pose it to SL Green in a sec, too. But let me just ask one more question of you about the Vanderbilt corridor in general. Um, you, you were very meticulous about uh, saying what the differences w between uh, LEED 2009 and LEED version 4 are. Uh, but advise us a little bit. What do you think we should be demanding as a council when it comes to buildings that are going through a special permit process through rezonings, what is the fair uh, demand that we should be uh, making of developers in this context? Should be, before version four is effective, should we be sticking with 2009? Should we be looking to version four? Guide us a little. I think that's going to be something that's evolving. I mean, on the one hand, you have a developer here using a standard no one else has used at a very high level. If someone comes for you in two years, probably going to ask them to raise the bar again. I mean, I think one of the things ultimately the council should be asking itself is, will this building still be a good performer 50 years from now? Because the building will still be around, just like Grand Central. 
And but it's going to be it's going to be a bar that keeps moving. This building is 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 moving to a moving bar. But I think that what this building you can the council consider successful for this building probably wouldn't be enough two or three years down the road when you get another application. Well, let me let me go back to SL Green. We had a number of conversations uh, initiated by the community about uh, this um, one Vanderbilt building getting to Lead Platinum. It, of course, is being proposed at Lead Gold, but under version four, which, as we just heard, probably would have had you at Platinum under the existing rules. Can you say a little bit, and we have covered this in, you know, in meetings, but I think it's important to discuss at this hearing, what the limitations were to you, if any, uh, about achieving platinum status under version four for lead? Sure, absolutely. Well, I think first and foremost, when looking at a newer version, you've got additional points and um, reorganization of how credits are looked at. There is greater stringency on the energy side with less points available to be able to support that. Um, but as to the specific criteria, just to talk about um, the feasibility of certain credits, there are certain things that don't apply to our project, whether we're in a high, pro, um, high priority site such as Brownfield, or the feasibility of being able to achieve enough, put up enough um, uh, solar panels to provide the right amount of renewable energy to meet lead criteria, or to put a, a large enough uh, cogeneration system at the building to increase your overall energy efficiency. And that also is what Sol was alluding to with the balance of the environmental component with the economics that makes sense for the project itself. So, and actually, let me just also uh, highlight a little bit further, when you, to break down the lead system, the lead version four is comprised of a total of about 110 points. When we had looked at what the feasible points available for the project are and what we could achieve, currently we're at 79 points, which is, sits below the platinum threshold. We're doing everything to cross into the platinum threshold. However, recognizing that this is a subjective type of system, we always like to recommend a buffer to guarantee a, in pr the pursuit of a certification or a certain level. So if you're at 80 minimum for a platinum, you want to try to choose five to 10% above that. So going to 84 to 88 points to qualify for. And when you look, about what, look at the points that are available, that is actually gonna be a big challenge to achieve. So you're at 79, there's a total of 110. You get to platinum at what level? 80, 80 is the platinum. 80, level. so you're at 79? 79, well, we're still uh, wrapping up some of the design components. And um, once you cross into 80, even if you hit that minimum of 80, it's not guaranteed. We've had other projects where we've pursued a gold level designation. We've gone in with 64 points. We've been awarded 60 to just meet the threshold. So that's why we like to promote that buffer to guarantee yourself the, or give yourself greater assurity of achieving a level of certification. And are some of the components here, some of the points that could be added, things that could only be achieved if subtenants of the building decide that they are willing to opt into? Is that, is that a, a part of this? Yeah, definitely there is a, there is a part to play for tenants uh, and looking for their participation on the energy efficiency side of things. You know, that plays a very large role within the LEED certification program. Um, and as I was mentioning earlier, there's other aspects like utilizing technology such as cogeneration to further enhance efficiency. Uh, right now we are utilizing a cogeneration system for the program. Um, upwards of a two megawatt system uh, in order to gain access to the additional points we would need to further enhance our total point amounts. We, we, we've, uh, we've talked about potential sizes of four to five megawatt systems, but that becomes very infeasible from economic and also a spatial standpoint. Okay, so bottom line here is you all are still going after points on the scale, but you're presently, you feel comfortable with uh, saying that you know you have 79 but you're, you're looking to go further? Now, we've always taken the position that's just, that we want to push the project as far as we can. We would love, you know, and always setting a goal to try to achieve platinum. However, based on where we are today and what we think is feasible for the project, that's why we've come out and uh, feel that a gold level certification is achievable. And I guess the question about feasibility, though, is really the key one, because as Mr. Unger noted a minute ago, uh, if feasibility could mean cost feasibility, feasibility could mean you know, as, as came up in one of our meetings, having to put solar panels on uh, the front of the, the whole facade of the building. When you say feasibility, what, what, you're talking about feasibility beyond cost, I think. But Correct. tell us what you mean. 
Well, there are also, um, you have to recognize that the lead system is addressing a broad diversity of buildings, um, both within the urban setting as well as suburban, and certain projects have the ability to access certain points that others may not. Um, for example, the high priority site and being a brownfield or special development site, that is something that we are not able to attain. So those are points that out of the 110 that we cannot achieve. So you're automatically set, starting off with less points available to your project. I got it. Well, what are the next 10 points that you think might be available to you then? Uh, next po 10 points? Yeah, I mean, you said that you're at 79, you're going after more points. So you have something in mind that is potentially feasible, but not necessarily feasible. Well, I think what do you have in mind? Uh, really, I think the, um, looking at the energy efficiency and water efficiency levels as the project continues to be developed and designed and understanding how it interacts with the potential exterior irrigation um, within, uh, within the site for roof setbacks, things of that nature, we may or may not be able to achieve those points, but we'll gain greater clarity as the project develops. All right, well, we certainly uh, encourage you to do that, and we thank you for your commitment, which is, which is clear, so thank you. Thank you. Mr. Greenfield, any questions or comments? No? We're good? Are you, are you preparing to ask questions? I couldn't tell. I actually do have a okay. uh, follow-up uh, question on the uh -huh. hotel permit that you, uh, yes. that you uh, mentioned. Um, might, have you looked at the possibility of keeping the permits overall, but excluding your particular property? We would be, my client would be thrilled. Okay. Exclude, excluded from the special permit requirement. Yeah. There are only f five sites in the corridor. One is being developed with a very beautiful building without a hotel by SL Green. Um, the FEIS says that there are only two potential development sites, the Roosevelt Hotel and the MTAs. So it would be fine to exclude the MTA's, I'm sorry, the Roosevelt Hotel site from the requirement of the special permit for redevelopment or development of a hotel, uh, provided we stay in the, in the uh, rezoning as it is otherwise provided. Okay, and the point is that could be done at this time, and then we could take up the issue later as we're looking at the entire broader area. Yes, I think it would be more appropriate to address the special permit requirement uh, as part of a, a broader, or as I said, comprehensive plan relating to Midtown. The Roosevelt Hotel otherwise would be the only hotel that, that is burdened with that requirement. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Well, thank you very much, this panel. Um, we are going to move on to another panel in opposition. I only have uh, two other slips here at the moment, so let me... First call up Andrea Goldwyn and Roxanne Warren. Is there anyone else here in opposition who hadn't filled out a sheet? Or whose name was not called? All right. Ladies, whenever you're ready, um, just make sure to say your name when you start your testimony. Um, and make sure the mic is on. You guys can sit next to each other if you want. Oh, you got the, the separate mics. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes, no problem. All right, good afternoon, Chair Weprin, Chair Greenfield, and Councilmember Gorodnik. I'm Andrea Goldwyn, speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. Our Public Policy Committee has met with City Planning Chair Weisbrob and his staff, and representatives from SL Green and Midtown Trackage, and we thank all for their continued willingness to discuss these issues. To start, we fail to see why the Landmarks Commission is not acting in concert with City Planning to calendar unprotected resources on Vanderbilt Avenue, We've requested designation for 51 East 42nd Street at the site of one Vanderbilt and recognize that it will likely be demolished, but there are still three buildings along the corridor eligible for listing on the state and national registers of historic places. These fine masonry buildings were designed by significant architects, some as part of Terminal City, which rightly recognized Grand Central as a focal point. Any new plans should consider how they can be supported and reused. Otherwise, we risk losing the special sense of place they create and their graceful relationship with Grand Central in favor of a wall of anonymous glass towers that could be found anywhere in the world with no connection to New York or to one of the nation's most important landmarks. 
Regarding one Vanderbilt, in testimony to the LPC, we did not see a harmonious relationship with Grand Central. At the ground floor, the design attempts that relationship, exposing a view of the terminal, but with its abundance of angles and sloping corner column, we feel it detracts from its neighbor. The visual connection between the two buildings should be stronger with a simplified base that does not compete. Following our initial meeting, the architects showed us modifications which other groups had suggested and took substantial time to discuss the building. We appreciate this response, but did not feel these changes rectified our key concerns. Transit improvements, of course, are critically necessary, and you must decide whether these would benefit anyone beyond workers at one Vanderbilt. But as a preservation group, we must analyze the bonus for the effects it could have on landmarks of today and tomorrow. We've been assured that the goals of preservation and transit will not be set against each other, but we're not convinced. Transit bonuses have existed for many years, mostly for small FAR in tandem with landmark transfers. We hope that the unprecedented increase of up to 15 for transit alone, along with the city's implicit backing in today's presentation, does not portend a less viable environment for landmark transfers. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Ma'am, whenever you're ready. My name is Roxanne Warren. I'm an architect and chair of the Vision 42 proposal for 42nd Street, light rail on 42nd Street. Um, the uh, city council should wait on the Vanderbilt Corridor rezoning proposal as a precedent uh, for upgrading this entire area around Grand Central. Uh, only then should rezoning occur. Uh, this is not an excuse for inaction but a call to arms for the City Planning Commission to address key problems that affect the long-term vi viability of the core of the city as a global business center. Uh, focusing on transportation issues, it is clear that adding new office space in a very dense area where sidewalks are o already overwhelmed with pedestrians and where, pedest and where subways are filled to the brim requires more Herculean efforts than those proposed in the current zoning rezoning plan. Uh, what's needed is a comprehensive street use plan for Midtown Manhattan that rationally allocates street space, the city's most valuable real estate, among competing users, pedestrians, cyclists, truck, truckers making deliveries, taxi passengers, private motorists, and ab above all, better surface transit. Uh, not only buses, but light rail trams, which have been so successful in re revitalizing cities throughout France, where pa transit patronage is not unlike our own in New York City. Um, let's see. Um, if, att uh, if attention had been paid uh, to the request that was formally made in December 2009 by the city Midtown Community Boards 4, 5, and 6 for a comprehensive street use plan, the city would already be well on its way to having an acceptable public realm plan uh, for this crowded area. Uh, the City Planning Commission has not made the case for rushing this rezoning to approval. There are few, few indications to su suggest uh, that East Midtown property owners are facing economic hardships. In fact, these properties are growing in value. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Greenfield. Thank you very much. Andrea. So I'm just I'm reading through your testimony. So just in, in short, you guys really don't like this. I mean, like it seems like you hate it, right? I mean, you don't like the fact it's too tall, it's knocking down buildings, you don't like the design. I mean, there seems to be very little that you You're actually like. You're speaking to her, right? Yes, oh, yes, yes. Are you Andrea Absolutely. as well? I'm sorry. Are you also Andrea? I'm sorry? Are you also Andrea? I apologize. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, okay, yes, yes, I'm sorry, I'm speaking to her. Um, so, is there anything you like about the project, or is it just no go as far as you're concerned? Because there's a lot of objections here, and I read through it carefully, I wanted to note them. Well, th thank you for reading it since I wasn't able to get everything in within the two minutes. I would say that the Conservancy in many instances supports new development. We've supported development in historic districts, we've supported additions to buildings, um, alterations. 
We feel there are a lot of issues with this building that we couldn't come to terms with. It is a very tall building, about the same height as the Chrysler building. We're concerned at overshadowing Grand Central, potentially right blocking it. view of Chrysler. Yep. We like the building that's there now, which was built specifically in harmony with Grand Central. So when the question came up, was there a harmonious relationship of this design with Grand Central, we just didn't see that. The specific design elements that we feel um, most directly address Grand Central, uh, we didn't see those as harmonious. So those were the concerns that we had. Okay, I just want to re-up my question specifically though. Is there anything you like about this proposal? Is there anything we like about this proposal? Yeah. Um, I'd have to go back and talk to our committee about that. I think I've only been authorized to say what's in the okay. statement. <laughs> would love to know, and if you wouldn't mind uh, sending me a note. Of course. Before we vote on this, I'd appreciate it. Of course. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Greenfield. Thank you, ladies. Um, I think we're okay. Thank you very much for your testimony. We are now going to move on to a panel in favor, and from here on in. Um, a, uh, Jim Gutman, uh, Donna Tucker, Kathleen Colhane and Marquisha Page. Marquisha? Is that four? I'm going to ask when I call your name, does this give me a here or an a, or an a key works also? Okay, we have all four though. Total a key. Okay, so again, the same, same rules. Two minutes. Uh, please state your name when you start your testimony. Try to speak into the mic and loudly if you could. Good morning. I am Jim Gutman, Vice President at the New York Office of Heinz. Heinz is a global development and investment management firm which has developed in excess of 275 million square feet globally of all use types. In New York City and the surrounding region, we have been involved in the development of approximately 15 million square feet of new space, mostly of large scale and complex projects, including 450 Lexington Avenue and 383 Madison Avenue, the only two major projects developed in and around Grand Central Terminal over the last 25 years. I am speaking today in favor of the proposed Vanderbilt Corridor rezoning and in favor of the special permit for one Vanderbilt a project that Heinz is an active project team member as development manager for SL Green. This rezoning and the one Vanderbilt project not only address a fundamental urban planning objective of locating density adjacent to mass transit centers and the supply of new modern office space, it will also create thousands of jobs and a source of new business for those in the construction industry for many years to come. Although building construction for one Vanderbilt is not expected to start until the first quarter of next year, immediately following the site demolition. SL Green and Heinz have already begun to think about a contracting program that offers the opportunity for qualified suppliers and contractors to provide portions of the project's trade work. Through the selection of the general contractor for the project in the coming months, the project will voluntarily implement a subcontracting program that will target 15% of the total trade cost to minority or women-owned businesses. We will do this by working closely with the general contractor as, as we have done on other projects to require subcontractors to stipulate with their bids their commitments for employing WNBE businesses and holding them contractually accountable for those percentages as the trade work is awarded. New York City has an abundance of experience and skilled contractors, and SL Green and Heinz are determined to make the project's contracting program for WMBE businesses a high priority. If you could wrap Thank it up. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Okay, good. Next, please. Hi, I am Markeisha Page, and I'm testifying today in support of SL Green and One Vanderbilt and the opportunities that it will help for the tradeswomen and tradesmen of New York. Uh, I'm an insulator and a graduate of non-traditional employment for women. I've been an insulator with local 12 heat and frost insulators since 2010. And I'm a journey level a tradeswoman mechanic. I can definitely vouch for my program in that it helps a lot of women who are searching for opportunities to get into the trades. 
It was founded in 1978. New prepares women in careers, careers in skilled construction, utility, and maintenance trades, helping women achieve economic independence. SL Green is committed to advancing our mission of expanding opportunity for women in the construction trades. The One Vanderbilt Project will provide opportunities for women from across New York City. SL Green is a long-standing partner of NU and in promoting tradeswomen on their projects across the city. NU is excited to continue our partnership by putting more women to work in highly skilled union jobs at One Vanderbilt. SL Green's investment in new transit infrastructure with One Vanderbilt will provide additional opportunities for new women. These opportunities will assure economic security for these women and their families. New provides the women of New York City with free training and access to high paying careers in the skilled trades. With New's training, graduates have access to careers with starting wages averaging $17 per hour, benefits, and a path to higher wage employment. New conducts recruitment in low income neighborhoods, increasing access to skilled trades careers and target employment of local residents on construction projects. New graduates are working as construction workers in the building trades and utilities industries, and thanks to a unique partnership between NU, the building and construction trades, contractors, and owners in New York City. Since 2005, NU has placed more than 1,000 graduates in the building and construction trades unions and another 1,000 graduates in other industry-related careers. Thank you on behalf of NU. This will help open up more opportunities. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, I'm Kathleen Colhane, president of NEW, Non-Traditional Employment for Women. And, Into um, the mic. And, and NEW is testifying today in support of SL Green and Wonder Vanderbilt. And again, the opportunities that this provides for the tradeswomen and tradesmen of New York City. Um, for NEW's program, um, in particular, as Marquisha stated, we, we tr we've placed over 1,000 women in the trades in the past 10 years. And there are limited opportunities for low and in low income and minority women to obtain secure jobs that provide a living wage and essential benefits in New York City. New students, particularly minority women, often face the greatest challenges in our city and opportunities like this one provide um, essential secure futures for tradeswomen and their families. Um, after participating in our programs, as Marquisha stated, improvements in wages and standard of living is dramatic. The average wage for new permanent job placement is $17 an hour, and these wages go up to around $40 per hour after their four to five year apprenticeship program. And the opportunities for direct entry that our program provides allow the women of New York City to provide that secure for future for themselves and their family. In the work we do, we work with many of New York City's leading development companies, and I can attest that SL Green is committed to advancing our mission to expand opportunities for women in the construction trades. The One Vanderbilt Project will provide opportunities for women from across New York City. And SL Green is a longstanding partner of non-traditional employment for women in promoting tradeswomen on their projects across the city. And we are excited to continue our partnership by putting more women to work on highly skilled unionized jobs. And the secure economic security that this will provide. Through an unprecedented investment for public improvements, SL Green's plans to address Midtown's transportation infrastructure crisis while creating 5,200 construction union jobs and 190 permanent union jobs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Ma'am. Oh, okay. I'm Donna Tucker, representing the Regional Alliance for Small Contractors. Uh, the Regional Alliance is a 501c3 organization incorporated in 1990 to provide services to minority, women-owned, and disadvantaged small businesses. The Regional Alliance was established through a unique public-private co cooperative venture among several public agencies and large construction-related firms. The Regional Alliance Board of Directors includes many of the region's key public agencies, major construction firms, and successful MWBE firms. John Tishman, former CEO of Tishman Realty and Construction Corporation, served as chairman of the Regional Alliance from 95 to 97. And today, Jay Padami, Chief Operating Officer of Tishman Construction Corporation of New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, serves as its current chairman. 
This commitment by the Tishman Company has been unwavering during our nearly 25 years in existence as there is a company belief of supporting small minority and women firms that provide services to the construction industry as well as inclusion of minorities and women in the labor forces working on the projects for which they have oversight. Since 1998, the Regional Alliance has provided contract monitoring and compliance services on five major contracts three of which in New York City, JetBlue Airways' $800 million terminal at JFK and Delta's redevelopment program at JFK and Delta's LaGuardia Airport connector project. The Regional Alliance exceeded the MWBE and workforce participation goals on all of the aforementioned projects. The Regional Alliance, in collaboration with Tishman Construction, developed an out-of-the-box MWBE labor force and community relations program for the aborted New York Jets New York Sports and Convention Center. The Regional Alliance has worked closely with SL Green in the past. We worked together to develop a very progressive minority women business and minority women labor force program for SL Green's Aqueduct project proposal. We believe that SL Green will do the same on this project. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you very much. Um, any questions from the panel? See none. Thank you very much. Appreciate your support and comments. Um, I'd like to now call up John Tritt, Hotel Trades Council, Edson Walkis from 32BJ, Daniel Contreras from 32BJ, and Carl Johnson from the Building Constructions Trades Council. Gentlemen. All right, whenever you guys are ready. Got it. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Tritt. I'm the Deputy Political Director of the Hotel Trades Council. Our union represents 32,000 hospitality workers in the New York City metropolitan area, many of whom work in or near East Midtown. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to be here today to testify in support of SL Green's plan to build a state-of-the-art office tower at 1 Vanderbilt Avenue and in support of a zoning text amendment for the Vanderbilt Corridor. Development that is done right, that creates good jobs, that improves the infrastructure of our city, and encourages positive business growth are vital to our city's future. By making sure Vanderbilt Corridor anchors a strong 21st century business district with the right combination of modern office buildings, full service hotels, and transit improvements, will lift all boats, so to speak, by providing a healthy commercial district to help drive NYC's economy. The proposed new office tower at 1 Vanderbilt Avenue is a great beginning to that end. SL Green's commitment to invest $210 million in capital, pro capital project and public transit improvements is important for the thousands of New Yorkers and visitors who work and travel through the area every day, including thousands of our members. Importantly, the rezoning includes a hotel special permit, which will ensure that any development in the corridor will have a positive, any hotel development in the corridor will have a positive impact on the community and such special permits should be included in all future rezoning of Midtown East. We feel the de Blasio administration has proven responsive to the concerns of the community, the business community and the labor with its Vanderbilt corridor proposal. And we thank the developer, SL Green, for working alongside labor and the community to ensure that this development creates good jobs and responsible development. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carl Johnson. I'm the organizer of Plumbers Local Union Number no. One, the Plumbers of New York City. I'm here on behalf. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York, and to express the council's strong support for the proposed One Vanderbilt Development Project. Through the unprecedented investment of $210 million in funding for public capital improvements in the heart of East Midtown, and at the doorstep of the Midtown Community Gateway. SL Green plans to address Midtown's transportation infrastructure crisis while creating 5,200 construction union jobs and 190 permanent union jobs. In addition to quality jobs, these improvements will create a fast, more efficient commute for residents of every borough, strap hangers from across the region, as well as tourists and visitors from around the world. The One Vanderville Project will reflect the city's vision to create a 21st century East Midtown with one Vanderbilt poised to anchor the transformation of the outdated Vanderbilt corridor. 
the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York and Plumbers Local One strongly urges this project, which brings significant public benefits to the community. Thank you for your time. Committee members, uh, Chairman, thank you for your opportunity to testify in support of Juan Vanderbilt. My name is Edison Walks. I am a member of Service Employees International Local Union 32BJ. Today I speak on behalf of the 75,000 members, janitors, doormen, security officers who live and work in New York City. I would like to express my support for the proposed tower development project at One Vanderbilt. As L. Green has committed to create a pathway for the middle class for hundreds of members that work in New York City buildings, providing good jobs with family coverage, retirement security, and training benefits. These jobs make it possible for our members, their families, to thrive in New York. At its One Vanderbilt office development, as L. Green has continued a commitment to creating job, quality jobs that will have a real economic impact for all New Yorkers. As Cell Green has, all, has fully engaged the community and labor unions to ensure community needs and benefits are met by the development project. These benefits go beyond local job creation to include significant transportation infrastructure improvements that will benefit adjacent areas and improve overall access to New York City. I support this project because it includes a commitment to provide good jobs, fair wages, retirement, and health benefits for maintenance, operations, and security workers. I urge you to support the SL Green Development Project. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Contreras. Chairman, council members, good afternoon. My name is Daniel Contreras, New York City political organizer for local SEIU 32BJ. As Edson stated, we represent 75,000 janitors, doormen, security officers who live and work in New York City and 150,000 members nationwide. I'm here today to express 32BJ's strong support for the proposed office tower, One Vanderbilt. As part of SL Green's plan to build a state-of-the-art office tower at One Vanderbilt Avenue, they have committed $210 million to funding public capital improvements in the heart of East Midtown and at the doorstep of the Midtown Commuter Gateway. This development will not only support the creation of thousands of construction jobs, but will also create a pathway to the middle class for hundreds of 32BJ members that work in New York City buildings, which will provide good uh, family health coverage, retirement security, and training benefits. These are the kinds of jobs that make it possible for our members and their families to thrive in New York City. This development will provide funding to improve commutes for subway riders and enhance connectivity and circulation for east side access riders and all users of Grand Central, and all users of Grand Central, but will also create $50 million in annual tax revenues. The public improvements associated with the plans of One Vanderbilt will have tangible impact on New Yorkers from every corner of the city, not just those who work or live in the area. SCIU 32BJ strongly supports the One Vanderbilt development and the significant public benefits that will bring for all New Yorkers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any comments or questions? Mr. Greenfield, with a quick question. Quick question, Daniel. How do you get the number 900 uh, jobs? Are those jobs are going to be created, or? Those are the jobs that will be created with the construction of this project. The Is actual it? breakdown in terms of what those jobs will are be. Are those permanent jobs or temporary per jobs? Permanent jobs. 900 permanent 32BJ jobs. That's correct. Not, they weren't all 32BJ, I don't believe, are they? I thought the chart had it broken down. I haven't, Two nine hundred. I haven't seen that chart. I can get you that information, though. The precise numbers. Send us a note. We'd appreciate it. It was I'll in the SL Green thing. They had it one slide. I thought it added up to nine hundred with all the unions, but I'm not sure. Okay, well, thanks. <laughs> That's why I asked. Oh, okay. Yeah, nine hundred jobs. It's okay, That's Daniel. Just I'll I'll finish the breakdown. breakdown. If you don't mind. Thank Absolutely. you. Okay. Thank you. Speaking of breakdown, um, yes. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We move on to the next panel. Uh, Dick Anderson from the New York Building Congress, Donald Rashti from Building Trades, uh, Carol Willis is here from Skyscraper Museum, and then Co Colin Wright. Now, what are we doing with Colin now? Okay, Colin is. Here. I'm. Conf oh no, I'm confused now. Yeah, Colin Wright. This is you were here. We called you before. 
from the New York League of Conservation Voters, right? That's you. Okay. And then. All right, let me add one more. One second. Um, and uh, how about uh, Sammy Name from the Municipal Arts Society? They here still? I understand that it's a busy day. He's here, but um, it's a busy day and the people have other places to go. So it, we will call out everyone if you know, who is in favor and make sure that people know that we're represented here if they do have to leave. So now here's our panel. Mr. Anderson, you want to get us started? How are you, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Council. Uh, I am Richard T. Anderson, President, New York Building Congress. The Building Congress strongly supports S.L. Green's redevelopment proposal for one Vanderbilt Avenue. This project will anchor a much needed renewal of the area's building stock and offer a model for future private investment in public infrastructure. We urge the Council to approve this plan. A study sponsored by the Real Estate Board last year demonstrated that East Midtown's building stock is inadequate to accommodate the changing needs of many commercial office tenants. With an average building age of 70 years, many buildings contain antiquated layouts and building systems unable to meet the needs of modern office tenants. One Vanderbilt changes this paradigm. SL Green will deliver an iconic new design that complements its historic neighbor Grand Central Terminal to the east. Inside, the office spaces will offer the layouts and amenities essential to attracting and retaining technology firms and other sectors that increasingly drive the city's economy. East Midtown is also home to MTA's East Side Access Project, providing a direct rail link between Long Island and Manhattan's East Side for the first time, bringing tens of thousands of new commuters to the neighborhood. One Vanderbilt capitalizes on this multi-billion dollar infrastructure investment building direct access from Grand Central Terminal into the building. Finally, as the Council is aware, for the right to erect this tower, SL Green will invest more than $200 million up front to construct improved transit access and create public open space where virtually none exists today. This investment is a model where government can use its zoning power to create value, which private developers use to implement important public benefits. Finally, the Building Congress further supports the larger Vanderbilt rezoning, which the Council is also considering. We believe it is contextual while creating important opportunities for future development that will complement One Vanderbilt. One Vanderbilt is simply not another office building and is an example of the type of sound planning and public-private collaboration the city must embrace if it is to remain competitive in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Good afternoon, Chairman Weprin, members of the council. Nice to see you, sir. <clears throat> uh, my name is Donald Ranchty. I am the senior vice president at the uh, Building Trades Employers Association. The BTA is a, a, an organization that represents over 2,200 uh, construction managers, general contractors, and subcontractors with uh, 80,000 workers, union workers, I might add, in New York City. We're here to strongly urge the council to support this application. Um, and the one proposed one Vanderbilt project um, sponsored by uh, developer SL Green. New York City currently has a problem, and that is even with the amount of commercial space that's, that's being uh, built at the World Trade Center and throughout the city, we still compete not only with London, but Singapore and Tokyo and Hong Kong and other emerging cities across the globe for uh, businesses that need state-of-the-art uh, commercial space that can uh, house all of the um, cutting edge technology available to them and New York City needs more of that. SL Green is proposing to do just that at One Vanderbilt. And not only that, but they'll merge into the surrounding area, complement its neighbor at Grand Central and build using union labor, 5,000 union construction jobs and then followed by over 200 full-time union employees um, to manage the building after it's done. $210 million, as you've heard a number of times, uh, to, to uh, improvements for Grand Central and East Side access. And speaking not only as a, uh, a member of the organization, but certainly someone who comes into Midtown from the Bronx every day, the East Side desperately needs that infrastructure upgrade. 
um, I urge you to support this and the BTA will do whatever it is uh, necessary to help make sure that this project is su successful. Thank you. Thank you. Did it, uh, everyone go? Um, Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Colin Wright with the New York League of Conservation Voters. I'm here testifying on behalf of Ya Ting Lu, who is the League's Director of New York City Sustainability Program. And I'm here to testify on behalf of NYLCV in support of One Vanderbilt Avenue. This project is a model for the type of sustainable, transit-oriented development projects that's, that not only help the city reduce its carbon footprint, but also provide concrete public benefits to New Yorkers. First, SL Green's commitment of $210 million will improve the commuting experience of strap hangers riding the 4, 5, 6, and S trains, improving connectivity, circulation, and crowding at the city's second busiest subway station. These improvements will help create a new direct connection to the east side access concourse level from one Vanderbilt's subgrade levels. In addition to east side access connectivity, this new subgrade corridor at one Vanderbilt Will, will enable commuters to effectively access and travel between the S shuttle, the 4567 lines, and Metro North lines without entering the overcrowded main concourse of Grand Central Terminal. Second, one Vanderbilt will, will also activate public space surrounding the terminal by creating a new 12,000 square foot public plaza on Vanderbilt Avenue adjacent to the Grand Central as well as a 4,000 square foot transit hall at the base of the tower. The public transit hall will have direct subgrade connection to Grand Central and will serve as an additional train waiting area and gateway to east side access. These new public spaces will improve circulation and alleviate crowding within the terminal and provide new designated places for commuters to congregate. Third, One Vanderbilt has an ambitious sustainability program that shows a deep commitment to green design. One Vanderbilt provides extensive access to amenities and uses walkability, and utilization of the broad mass, mass transit system. And it, will not, and it will not include parking for tenants, reducing congestion in the area, and also the building's carbon footprint. In addition, the building includes a 60,000 gallon rainwater collection feature, high efficiency heating and cooling, LED lighting, aggressive recycling measures, and many other measures that collectively increase the high water mark for, for sustainable design. The public improvement plans for one Vanderbilt will create a faster, more efficient commute for residents and visitors at one of, the one of the country's busiest transit terminals while setting higher standards for what green buildings can achieve in New York City. Thank you. Okay, next and longest. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sammy Naeem. I am uh, Vice President of Law and Policy at the Municipal Arts Society. I'm here on behalf of MAS to testify in support of the one Vanderbilt. Yeah, this is, there you go. Uh, of the One Vanderbilt Project and the Vanderbilt Corridor Rezoning. Uh, regarding the One Vanderbilt Project, uh, MAS believes that the building provides significant benefits to the city and the East Midtown area. Uh, the building also could serve as a model for future development in the city, especially around critical transit hubs. We commend the developer, SL Green, for its responsiveness to the community's concerns and questions throughout the Euler process. Our support for One Vanderbilt rests on the following contributions. Significant transit improvements to Grand Central Terminal in anticipation of increased ridership from East Side Access and the Second Avenue Subway. A pedestrian plaza on Vanderbilt with initial seed funding for maintenance in an area that sorely lacks publicly accessible open space. Thousands of square feet of Class A office space ensuring that the area remains competitive with other business districts in the region. And a world-class architectural design that also addresses sustainability concerns. Uh, having said that, we just have two concerns that we would like to see addressed. First, we will still believe that the building should provide publicly accessible space at the, both the top floor and the second floor terrace that overlooks Grand Central Terminal. Second, we ask that the city take clear steps to provide interagency coordination for both the off-site transit improvements and the pedestrian plaza to ensure that these amenities are delivered to the public without undue burden or delay. Regarding the Vanderbilt Corridor rezoning, MAS believes that this rezoning makes sense for the city and East Midtown area as well. Uh, we are particularly supportive of the following, uh, situating high density commercial development adjacent to Grand Central Terminal, leveraging uh, private development to help secure necessary transit improvements, and requiring all major development projects within the corridor to go through a full public review process. That being said, we have two concerns regarding the rezoning. First, we share the concern of both the local community board 
regarding the narrow streets and also uh, the Landmarks Preservation Commission issue uh, and ensuring coordination between LPC and CPC. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. I don't think there are any questions. We thank you, Mr. Anderson, and all of you. Donald, I hope you're enjoying the new gig, and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you. Um, Tom Wright from the Regional Plan Association, Joe Rosenberg of the Archdiocese, Catholic Community Relations Council, Michael Silverman, Central Synagogue, and Leo Corte from Leverhouse, Leverhouse. Um, are all four here? Sorry about that. Uh, do we have? One, two, three. Do we have four? I see. Did we call your name? Mr. Wright. Who are you here for? Oh, you're here for Tom Wright? You didn't get Mr. Wright. He just left. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. Come on up. <coughs> uh, just, listen, there's a point where, you know, there's diminishing returns. I just want to warn uh, the, uh, the advocates. There's, there's starting to be a movement here to vote and get more and more no votes are appearing all of a sudden the more it goes on. But try not to repeat too much after, uh, if you can. Um, Whenever you're ready, uh, keep it. Mr. Rosenberg, why don't you sure. get started? Sure. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Weapon, members of the uh, City Council's Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Joseph Rosenberg, the Director of Catholic Community Relations Council, and I'm testifying on behalf of the trustees of St. Patrick's Cathedral in support of the proposed zoning amendments for the Vanderbilt Corridor and the proposed special permits for the one Vanderbilt development. St. Patrick's Cathedral is a spiritual home to millions, including the 2.6 million Catholics residing in the Archdiocese of New York. St. Patrick's received landmark designation in 1966. As one of the oldest structures in East Midtown, St. Patrick's has seen well over a century of change in this neighborhood. Continued revitalization is critical if this community is to prosper. The proposed Vanderbilt corridor zoning would appropriately allow for the increased density near a major transit hub. The potential benefits to, in, to transit infrastructure resulting from this proposal are demonstrated by the wide array of improvements proposed as part of the one Vanderbilt project. We particularly support the increased opportunities for landmarks to transfer development rights under the city's proposal. Absent the ability to transfer and use development rights, it is very difficult to fund the upkeep of landmark structures as is required under the landmark law. This is particularly difficult in the case of landmarks owned by religious entities. For example, the current program to fully restore St. Patrick's to ensure it endures for future generations is estimated to cost in excess of $175 million. The available zoning tools do not provide any opportunities for transfer of the unused development rights from the church, and an expansion of transfer opportunities is critical to enable owners of landmark properties to properly maintain their buildings. By allowing development up to 30 FAR of the special permit, of which up to 15 FAR may be transferred from a landmark, the city's proposal is substantially increasing opportunities for landmarks to transfer unused development rights. We urge that the up coming planning efforts for East Midtown follow the lead of the Vanderbilt Corridor and expand opportunities for the transfer of development rights from landmark properties. The Vanderbilt Corridor rezoning will encourage reinvestment in Midtown and keep New York City competitive. The One Vanderbilt Project demonstrates this. We therefore support these proposals and urge this committee and the City Council to approve them. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Pierina Sanchez, Associate Planner at RPA for New York, and I'm stepping in for our President, Tom Wright. Um, I'm here today to testify in strong support of the Vanderbilt Corridor rezoning and application for one Vanderbilt. Um, try not, I'm going to try not to repeat too much, but by almost any measure, jobs, office space, salaries, taxes, rents, East Midtown has few rivals around the globe. It is one of the greatest generators of prosperity and wealth that humans have ever invented, a 24-hour district with iconic buildings, wonderful public spaces, extraordinary transit access, and a concentration of firms that literally shape markets and businesses around the world. But the older building stock in this neighborhood needs regular rebuilding to ensure that we can uh, provide the services, amenities, and technology requirements of rapidly improving industries. With an estimated 2 million new jobs destined for the region over the next 25 years by RPA's own calculations, um, <coughs> as well as in consultation with NIMTIC, the New York Metropolitan Transportation Organization, uh, we will also need room to expand in East Midtown as well as in Lower Manhattan, the Far West Side, and other office districts throughout the region. Securing and safeguarding the future of this district is our responsibility for future generations who will benefit from the decisions that you all make today. 
At Regional Plan Association, we pay special attention to the infrastructure systems that make the concentration of activity of uh, this activity uh, possible, including the housing markets that provide our, our labor, uh, sorry, <laughs> our labor force, uh, the movements of goods to support these workers, and of course the transit system, which is the, life, the lifeblood of our city. The maintenance and expansion of this system is among our highest priorities. So I won't go into all the reasons why we also agree that $250 million in improvements are a great deal for the city. Um, and I'll just note, you know, for, for the record that uh, these investments won't fix all of, all of the circulation problems at Grand Central Terminal, Terminal, especially those involving the number seven train where use and congestion will increase when the new 34th Street station opens and as the far west side is developed. Um, however, the most important decision before you today is to approve the zoning application so that one Vanderbilt and improvements to our transit system can move forward as quickly as possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Silverman. Good afternoon, Chair Weprin and committee members. Rather than speed read, I'll summarize my re remarks and leave a prepared statement. Central Synagogue is the oldest Jewish house of worship in continuous worship in the state of New York. It's been here since 1870. Sanctuary on East 55th Street and Lexington Avenue. 2,000 households and more, more than 6,000 individuals in the congregation. We appear to encourage your full support of the Vanderbilt Corridor rezoning and the One Vanderbilt Project as the first step in developing a comp comprehensive new plan for East Mid Midtown. We, we cherish the landmark status of our sanctuary, one of the first New York City landmarks that was designated that was reemphasized by the disastrous fire and restoration in August 1988. Our sanctuary has approximately 150,000 square feet of unused development rights, but current zoning provisions do not provide adequate opportunities for the use and transfer of these development rights. In, in particular, our community house is located directly north of our sanctuary across East 55th Street, but because it sits on a merged zoning lot, that's, it, it's overbuilt by more than 20% and it's not an eligible receiving site. We therefore welcomed the more flexible and enhanced provisions in the original Midtown rezoning that would al have allowed more opportunities for that transfer. Um, we appear today to urge you to adopt the, the Vanderbilt Corridor proposal and then to include a similar innovative transfer mechanism for landmarks in the, the strategic framework for the revised East Midtown proposal. We ask that the revised transfer mechanism be flexible, allow transfer in a wide receiving area, and permit development at a high density of up to 30 FAR. So after a long day of testimony, as we did at city planning, we wish you the wisdom of Solomon in completing this exercise. Thank you. Thank you. Does the, di does the diocese agree with that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> On the record, yes. Okay, thank you. Off the record, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Leo. Hello, I am Leo Corrine, and I am here representing my family office as the owners of Lever House, two other landmarks, 240 Central Park South and 608 Fifth Avenue. I'm here to speak in favor of city planning's applications regarding the Vanderbilt Corridor. I'm going to skip ahead to the point of this, which is that the, mod sorry. the modification of the existing Grand Central Subdistrict Landmark Transfer Special Permit is an excellent first step in refreshing East Midtown for the 21st century. Many landmarks will only be able to contribute their unused development rights to the planning goals in the area if this modification is enacted and expanded. Unfortunately, the modification proposed still requires the ULERT process limiting its potential benefits. Further, we are concerned that the modification to the landmark special permit and the public realm improvement bonus will compete with each other. This creates a potential conflict if developers are allowed to negotiate the value of landmark development rights against the value of public realm improvements. Such negotiations would divide stakeholders and undermine the potential benefits that this rezoning seeks to create. It would be preferable to create a public realm improvement bonus that developers would be incentivized to use in tandem with the landmark transfer special permit 
as opposed to having them in direct competition. And we are committed to ensuring that Lever House remains an iconic building and an active part of a thriving and globally competitive East Midtown. We believe that thoughtful changes like the modification of the existing Grand Central Subdistrict Landmark Transfer Special Permit for the Vanderbilt Corridor proposal can be beneficial to landmarks and the neighborhoods they belong to. We hope that the Vanderbilt Corridor proposal and any further rezoning in East Midtown consciously support landmarks' ability to transfer their development rights without creating unintended conflicts with other planning goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any comments or questions? I'll say no and thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to call up Nick Sifuentes, Gene Russinoff. Is he here, Gene? I saw him earlier today, but Mitchell Moss, Jen Hensley, or Effie. I don't know if they're a, they're a tag team or what. I didn't see her, though. Uh, I'm going to keep, where's the next? Let's, I think, how many is that here? If I call your name, say, say here, acknowledge that you're here, because we lost some people. Is Mike Slattery here? Oh, there you are, Michael. I didn't even see you there. Come on up. Peter, Peter Lempin. Peter's here? Good. You guys are getting it now. Bill Higgins. All right, Bill Higgins. This is it. Is uh, Vishan here as well? Vish no? Okay, come on up. I think, no, I think that may be it. Okay, gentlemen, we could sort this out. Mr. Slatter, you're closest to the mic. Go grab it while you can. You can start us off. Am I on? Okay. They get very sensitive about that button thing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we've been long time, uh, my name is Mike Slattery. I'm with the Real Estate Board of New York. We've been long time advocates for the rezoning of East Midtown and support the proposed Vanderbilt Corridor text amendment and a special permit application for one Vanderbilt. Uh, Department of City Planning has developed a sound proposal along the five block Vanderbilt Corridor to encourage modern commercial development by allowing more flexibility in the transfer of landmark development rights. The proposal to create a mechanism to link new development to the much needed infrastructure and public realm improvements in Grand Central is important and the only realistic source of funding for the foreseeable future. One Vanderbilt is exactly the type of dense transit area development that belongs immediately adjacent to Grand Central Terminal. We think this building will be a model for the type of development we can look forward to on Vanderbilt. SL Green's investment of more than $200 million in transit infrastructure and public growth improvements uh, is a significant contribution. We want to stress, however, the significance of this commitment to complete this work as a condition of occupancy is a significant contribution and commitment. Below ground transit work is costly, uncertain, and prone to over overruns. This investment will immediately improve pedestrian circulation in and around Grand Central. There is a general agreement that East Midtown's existing zoning is an impediment to necessary modernization of its aging building stock. It is important to note that the 30 FAR proposed by city planning is the best opportunity to maximize the needed transit improvements while at the same time affording an opportunity to utilize the unused air rights in this district. SL Green's blend of transit improvements and utilization of air rights is a model for future development. This model will make substantial and needed public realm improvements and better addresses the long-simmering problem of the transferability of development rights from landmarks. The Vanderbilt blocks also offer unique and unparalleled conditions that justify 30 FAR, such as the proximity of these blocks to superior transit connections at Grand Central that would offer a direct indoor link at Grand Central Terminal to east side access and the network of subway lines, and the full block sites that would also permit new development to front on four streets that would improve and enhance pedestrian flow. The higher FARs serve as a catalyst for new development that allows owners to embark on a challenging and unique opportunity to improve urban design and make important architectural statement and fund needed to transit improvements. Lastly, new development that uses the higher flower of Laurier should, along Vanderbilt, will go through a special permit process. If there are legitimate and compelling reasons to lower a project's FAR, it should be done at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slattery. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Committee members, my name is Peter Lempin, representing the Grand Central Partnership, the Midtown Manhattan Business Improvement District, which is proud to have the subject applications within our district. <coughs> on behalf of our Board of Directors, we welcome the opportunity to comment on the SL Green Pro Vanderbilt Project and the City's Vanderbilt Corridor proposal. <coughs> Today, our community faces a new challenge that, if not properly and promptly addressed, 
will put the preeminence of our area at risk by allowing it to decline into competitive disadvantage. <clears throat> this challenge comes in the form of an aging infrastructure of commercial properties that frequently fail to meet the needs of Class A and high-tech firms in the growing 21st century world economy. While we know the longer-term zoning plan for the East Midtown neighborhood is currently the subject of ongoing discussions in the steering committee co-chaired by your colleague Dan Gorodnik in Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, of which we are a participant, in our view, today's proposals represent an important step forward in addressing this issue as the proposed actions would allow for the creation of exactly the type of modern, efficient, and sustainable commercial office space that today's corporate tenants demand. For example, the Vanderbilt Carter text amendment would allow for an increase in the floor area ratio to 30, 30 <coughs> excuse me, a sensible, rational, and lasting idea which is sustainable given that the transit improvements now underway and those in the making can support this change in density. We believe that by approving the one Vanderbilt Tower, which contributes millions of dollars in public transportation improvements that will help to ease commuter congestion in and around Grand Central Terminal, a huge step will be made towards modernizing our aging infrastructure in Midtown East. The project will also create thousands of good paying jobs. These vitally needed improvements will be solely funded by SL Green and would not be possible without the investment of one Vanderbilt, a significant benefit for tenants, commuters, and the community at large. We urge you to approve the, these proposals, which help to revolutionize the Vanderbilt corridor and the adjacent surroundings to preserve the Grand Central area as a world-class destination for business and for those who visit and live nearby. This is exactly the type of development our city needs to grow and strengthen the local economy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, please. Mr. Sean, we're going to bring you up after. Like, <coughs> we're going to separate you out. And we have Professor Morris here, too. So we're going to let you close. Yeah. Next, next, two. Thank you, and good afternoon, committee members. I'm Nick C. Fuentes, Deputy Director of the Riders Alliance. Uh, I'm submitting testimony today to the public hearing uh, in, on behalf of four uh, transportation groups, the uh, Strapangers Campaign, the New York City Transit Riders Council, the Tri-State Transportation Campaign, and of course our organization, the Riders Alliance. Uh, you have many aspects of, of the proposal before you to consider neighborhood impact, height, density, aesthetic judgments, and so on. We can speak to one aspect of that project within our expertise. We believe the transit improvements that the developer SL Green has committed to undertake would make a significant difference in the lives of hundreds of thousands of daily riders. Currently, the MTA runs fewer rush hour trains than the Lexington Avenue tunnel can handle, in part because of design flaws on the platform level of the Grand Central 42nd Street subway station. Outdated infrastructure also hinders the free flow of riders who are transferring between trains or entering or leaving the station. Without improvements, the flow of pedestrians uh, around Grand Central 42nd Street Station will become worse when east side access attracts many thousands of LIRR riders every day. The improvements that SL Green proposes to make, generated in consultation with the MTA about its top priority needs, would take a significant step towards fixing some of the longstanding problems. These include new entrances, wider platforms, longer sight lines for better navigating this packed station, and thousands of square feet to be added to station mezzanines. They're likely to be finished, and in a timely way, as occupancy a part of the building is contingent on completion of the, of the improvements. They set an important precedent that development in Midtown and elsewhere in the city will rely on improved transit infrastructure and must provide funds for such improvements. To be clear, our groups cannot speak to every aspect they, that you and community boards are considering regarding the proposal, but we do support what this project would do for the public transit infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last on this panel, and then we'll do the last panel. Yeah. We need to move this. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is William Higgins. I'm a partner at Higgins Quaysbarth and Partners, and we are the landmarks consultants to SL Green in the One Vanderbilt Project, and I'm here to testify briefly, I assure you, that uh, <coughs> the project which will be made possible by the actions before you today uh, will result in a building which is highly harmonious and compatible uh, with Grand Central Terminal. Uh, the building has been very carefully uh, designed by its architects, KPF, with consultancy from the entire team. 
um, to be at the same time a very modern building, but one which is highly responsive to Grand Central Terminal uh, and which enhances many of the characteristics uh, of, of the terminal, some of which are less visible now than they will be when the project is done. Also, the scale of the building. Uh, Grand Central has always been uh, part of Midtown Manhattan, and in the history of Midtown Manhattan, there has been a continuous vertical growth and therefore a continuous juxtaposition of buildings of varying heights, many of them considerable, uh, uh, as neighbors of Grand Central Terminal. And this will continue that uh, with a very highly harmonious and uh, well-designed building, which we think will be uh, a, a strong contributor to Midtown and to its immediate Grand Central context. We urge you to approve the uh, proposals that are before you today to make that possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Any questions, Dan? Seeing none, uh, thank you, guys. Vishon, we're going to go. And Professor Moas, if you can come up and take one of the seats. Is there anyone else here who is to testify on this item? Yes? Oh, okay. Did you fill out a slip by any chance? Okay, come on up. Join the party. Anybody else? All right. So I think these are the last three to testify today. Vishan, why don't you go first? Sure. Uh, you at least were first at the table. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, council members, I'm Vishan Chakravarti. I'm a partner at Shop Architects, a professor at Columbia, and also a consultant for SL Green. Uh, I know you've had a long day, so I just want to make two quick points. One is that the level of amenities that have been agreed to already by Essel Green at One Vanderbilt for a 30 FAR building far surpass many other projects of that density that have already been improved, including one Bryant Park at 28 FAR, one World Trade Center, which is over 40 FAR, Hudson Yards, and Times Square. And so I just think it's very important that as people ask for more and more to think about the fact that we already have a lot of precedents on this. Second point I just want to raise is I know you've had some back and forth about whether you want to create new standards for you know, a, a building on, on two streets as opposed to one and, and so forth. And I would just, er, you, you've done an extraordinary job negotiating these amenities with SL Green. And I'm not sure why council or city planning would want to have their hands tied in terms of potentially overly rigid um, uh, 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 kind of uh, criteria as opposed to your own discretion, right? Something doesn't have to hit 30 FAR in this quarter. You can say it's 24 or 26 or 28, depending on your own judgment. I'm not sure why you would want to take that judgment away by creating specific standards, uh, because this is a proof and point of how you've been able to negotiate terrific public amenities without having those standards in place. So those are the only two points I want to bring up today. I don't think uh, Dan Garodnik's wife would allow him to have to negotiate each one of these. <laughs> um, so, um, Professor Moore, uh, whichever you want to, it's up to you. Beauty before age. Okay. Um, well, I'm Carol Willis. I'm the Please speak into the mic and clearly and loudly. All right. I'm Carol Willis. I'm the founding director of the Skyscraper Museum, and I'm happy to be here again in order to speak in favor of density for Good to Midtown. See you too. Thank you. Um, but I do speak here for. Um, uh, as a historian and for myself rather than for the museum per se, and I'll, I'll skip quickly down in the conversational mode of Yishan to uh, endorse the same idea of the historical precedent that it exists for a great density uh, with government actions to encourage uh, successful urban zones. Um, so s after appraising the monumentality and the uh, the excellent design to contribute to the public, public realm that KPF has done for SL Green, I would note that uh, the proposed increased density on the additional sites on the Vanderbilt corridor should be viewed in historical perspective. At the 30 FAR achieved by the accrued bonuses, these buildings will equal the ratios of successful skyscrapers of two eras. First of the great Art Deco landmarks, um, such as uh, the uh, Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building of the 1920s that were slightly larger and smaller than 30 FAR respectively. The 20s towers are tall and distinctive because they were created 
uh, before the 1916 zoning law imposed the constraints of FAR. It should be noted that the 1961 law and its later revisions always envisioned the possibility of bonuses based on the idea of public good. This was the premise of, tr of trading um, air rights for space on the ground. That principle was leveraged by government in, the, in Times Square in the guidelines of the 1980s to create 30 FAR skyscrapers on 42nd Street at Four Times Square um, and others that are all logically located just above the transit nexus. Um, these have fueled the success of Times Square's revival as both an office location and a tourist hub. For these reasons, among others, I urge the City Council to vote yes in favor of one ba Vanderbilt and the Vanderbilt Corridor proposals. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Moss, you're last. Mr. Chairman, Councilman Korodnik, I want to say one thing. The two busiest subway stations in New York City are Times Square and Grand Central. Density is not an accident. It's a result of the infrastructure. What's important here is not that, Madison, that Vanderbilt Avenue have more density, it's to recognize that Vanderbilt Avenue is linked to more parts of the city where people need to get jobs than any other street in New York. Let me say how we did this. There are 360,000 subway riders who either come through Bryant Park, 51st Street, and 53rd and 3rd Avenue, 14th Street, or Grand Central, meaning they're one stop away. If you want New Yorkers to have jobs, they have to be where the subway system, which was built 100 years ago, gets them to. So it's a simple question. This is not just a matter of Manhattan. This is a matter of how people in Queens and Brooklyn can find jobs that are accessible by mass transit. I have in my hands what we used to call captured enemy documents. They're from the MTA website, which, as you know, hides everything on that website. And we did a quick analysis of the ridership. It's not just a matter of the Long Island Railroad coming in or Metro North. It's New Yorkers who come to this corridor because that's where the jobs are accessible. We have to improve density here so that the people who want to work can use the mass transit system to get to work. That allows us to have low density neighborhoods, whether it's in Electchester or whether it's in Gun Hill Road or whether it's in parts of Sheepshead Bay. We can't have low density unless we have high density along the Vanderbilt Avenue corridor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Moss. Mr. Garodnik. Thank you, and I, I agree with that point, by the way, about density on this corridor. This is where it belongs. You want to have your density closest to your main transit hubs, and I think that that's one of the, the key parts of this proposal and one of the things that I think is most uh, exciting. Uh, I just want to go back to the comment about overly rigid criteria, because I think what we are after is some criteria, not overly rigid criteria. We have a plan which allows for a special permit on every site. We have the ability to trade uh, and get infrastructure improvements in exchange for density up to 30. But what we lack is the ability for us to know from one project to the next the criteria which were applied on the prior sites. And so I think what you saw me take uh, city planning through was an effort to try to define the site characteristics mm -hmm. that might entitle somebody to go up to, to 30 FAR. Um, in order to give us some parameters or guidelines. But I, I don't, I wouldn't regard them as uh, overly rigid. I would just regard them as some, uh, some standards for future applicability. So I just wanted to make that, that point to you. And with that, Mr. Chairman, you have been a gentleman and a scholar. Thank you for all of the time today. Thank you, Mr. Gorodnik, and thank you for your patience. Thank you all for uh, your cooperation today. Uh, anyone else here to testify on this matter? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Uh, we are now going to close this public hearing on land loose 197 through 2001 inclusive. 201. It just felt like 2001. Uh, 197 through 201. Um, and uh, we're going to close this hearing and we'll be talking about it and be voting at a future date. So thank you all very much. Once again, have a good day. The meeting is now adjourned. I think we should make a good team, don't you? There you go, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>